Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, which is being held remotely. Today is Tuesday, August the 10th, 2021. And as you can tell, we are live. I will now take roll call to confirm attendance. Please unmute your mic and respond when your name is called. Supervisor Mitchell. Good morning, Good morning. President. Good morning. Supervisor Kuehl. Good morning, I'm here. Great. Supervisor Hahn. Good morning, nice to see you all. <laughs> Thank you. Supervisor Barger. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Deja Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Good morning, President. Nicole Tinkham and Don Harrison, Chief Deputies, County Council. Good morning, we're both here. Thank you. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board. I'm here. Great. With that, members, I'm going to call on Supervisor Mitchell to lead us in our morning meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colleagues, if you'll face the flag and put your right hand over your heart, ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, members. As indicated on the posted agenda, we'll be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. The Executive Office of the Board received over 34,000 written public comments for today's meeting. And as those written comments were received, all of them were made available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act requirements. We will continue to receive written public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Madam Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, set matter 1030 AM. Item S1 is a discussion of the public health order related to COVID-19. This item will be held for discussion. On page three, special district agendas. This is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. Item 2D is a recommendation to adopt a resolution to undertake multifamily housing revenue bond financing in an amount not to exceed 75 million to finance the construction and development of the Vermont Manchester Family Project a 118 unit affordable housing project in the city of Los Angeles. Item 3D is a recommendation to adopt a resolution to undertake bond financing in the amount not to exceed 37,950,000 to finance construction and development of West Los Angeles Veterans Affair Building, 402 apartments consisting of 120 units of prefabricated modular housing for homeless veterans on the West Los Angeles Veterans Affairs Campus in the unincorporated county of West Los Angeles. On page seven, this is the agenda for the Regional Park and Open Space District. On page eight, consent calendar, Board of Supervisors items one through 24. On item one, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item four, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On item five, Supervisor Solis and Supervisor Q would like to revise directive number one of their joint motion to instruct the Director of Consumer and Business Affairs to work with local community-based mission-driven entities, housing providers, real estate professionals, and other relevant stakeholders to review best practices and lessons learned. On item six, Supervisor Solis would like request that this item be held. On item 14, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On item 15, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 16, Supervisor Kuehl requests that this item be held. This includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 21, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. Also, Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Kuehl would like to revise their joint motion by deleting directive number three, requiring workforce members who work in the healthcare sitting settings to be fully vaccinated for COVID-19 within the next 60 days as mandatory conditions for employment or contract service. 
on page 33, administrative minor matters, items 25 through 75. On item 25, the Chief Executive Officer requests that this item be continued to August 31st, 2021. On item 36, 26th, the Chief Executive Officer requests that this item be continued to October 19th, 2021. On item 54, the Inspector General requests that this item be continued to August 31st, 2021. On page 57, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 73, excuse me, on item 73A, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On item 73B, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. On item 73C, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. On item 73E, Supervisor Kiel requests that this item be held. On item 73F, Supervisor Kiel requests that this item be held. The request for continuances through 73F are before you. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve these items. That will be the order. On page 58, ordinance for introduction. On page 59, separate matter. On page 60, notice of closed session. That completes the reading of the chair, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, we will hear from Sheriff Villanueva, who has requested to address the board on items 16 and 73F, and he will have three minutes. Please begin, Sheriff. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Solis. Item number 16, I believe Measure J was found to be unconstitutional in a court ruling here in Superior Court. However, now you're changing the name from Measure J to a, uh, to a what is this called? A uh, Care First and Community Investment Advisory Committee instead of the Measure J Advisory Committee. However, changing the name of it does not change the nature of it. This act is not, there's not any momentum behind care first in jail last. There's momentum behind uh, taking care of the homeless crisis that's engulfing the county. There's momentum behind getting rid of the legal marijuana grows in the high desert dispensaries in the Southland. There's momentum behind uh, trying to find a way to solve our surge in homicides. It is now at 70% increase in homicide victims compared to last year at the same time. That is where the momentum is at. That is public safety. So the $100 million that was removed from the Sheriff's Department budget and put in a provisional funding unit to then hand it over to the Measure J, all you're doing is changing the name, but it's the very same problem. And I looked through this entire item number 16 and it looks like a, a bureaucratic orgy of wokeness is the best way to describe this thing. Oh, my God. In a race-based uh, appointments to a 24-member advisory committee, that, uh, I don't know, do you even clear this through county council to the constitutionality of this? It sounds, uh, it sounds, I don't know, it's hard to even describe this and I thought I'm rather educated on public administration affairs. I read through this entire motion, and all it is is a giveaway of taxpayer funds that belongs in public safety to keep people alive, and you're going to give it to 501c3s that you control, and uh, they're your friends. And that is the same homeless industrial complex nature, the service providers. All this money is going to be spent with zero accountability, zero oversight, and just like with the homeless initiative, $6.5 billion over 10 years to see the problem double. So now that we have desperate needs for public safety, safety funds to address these major threats that we're facing, I have homicide investigators stretched to the limit trying to make do with a staggering caseload. They can't keep up with it. And we're robbing Peter to pay Paul just to satisfy all the demands of our custody environment. And that $100 million you should reallocate it back to public safety where it belongs so we can keep people alive and safe in LA County. And then only you can start reimagining things when people are safe, but they're not going to do it the way you've done it so far. And this measure, I think, is a fraud, the whole thing. And this entire Care First Jail Last 
you need to start rethinking it real quick. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sheriff uh, Villanueva. However, I know I respectfully disagree with you. Um, now, members, we will now take public comments for all agenda items. Madam Executive Officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. To repeat, please call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-8163. 873-8017 and follow the instructions. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which agenda items you wish to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes. <clears throat> we will allocate up to 60 minutes for public comment on all of the items. If there are no speakers waiting before 60 minutes have lapsed, we will close public comment. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on a topic or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from County Council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speakerphone, you will need to turn, the, turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, Please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this meet reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la junta, si no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego cero en este momento. No presione uno y cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. May we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Jackie Carter. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, I am addressing item 73A and I do have a comment. I am, work, I am a nurse working at LA County USC Medical Center. And I understand that the epidemic is something obviously none of us have experienced before, but I believe that the science demonstrates that the vaccine is safe. My concern is being able to come to work and being able to do my job to feel safe that my coworkers are vaccinated and that is not a concern that we are not receiving sick calls and that we are not short staffed. Therefore, I just support the motion by Supervisor Solis, thank you very much, that employees should be vaccinated. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next speaker will come from line of Cab Rhodes. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I will be addressing agenda items number 21, 73A and general comment. Madam Chair and members of the board, my name is Tao Rhodes, and I'm the president of the Los Angeles County Professional Peace Officers Association, which represents over 9,000 active and retired members of the county workforce. Our members, by definition of their roles, advocate for the safety of the citizens of Los Angeles County. However, the COVID-19 pandemic, like many other issues in society currently, is often defined by emotion. Many of our membership have already been vaccinated or as frontline responders, 
suffered the effects of COVID-19, presumably now having antibodies against future infection. Others have strong feelings related to the vaccine and its lack of FDA approval. For these reasons, we cannot support a blanket mandate of vaccinations for county employees as defined in 73A. While we understand the governing responsibilities of the Board of Supervisors during this health crisis, our association believes the executive order of item 73 as written is too restrictive and will actually harm the intention. Conversely, our members would appreciate a more comprehensive review by the Board of Supervisors of the related motion, item number 21. The built-in options of obtaining a vaccination and or weekly testing would be viewed by our members as more beneficial, collaborative, and present a level of individual compliance, which is the ultimate goal, navigation of this pandemic and returning to life as normal. For our membership to fully embrace compliance with COVID-19 protocols, we need more information about proposed policies and testing procedures. If we could, one suggestion would be to research existing best practices of other public entities including the recently presented protocols enacted by the California Department of Public Health as it related to state employees. These protocols seem to communicate the state's intentions in addressing this pandemic, as well as could be used for uniformity towards employees of the county with those of neighboring cities and counties. The Los Angeles County Professional Peace Officers Association is grateful for the recognition by this board of the importance of engaging with the county's labor partners. We fully appreciate this and other opportunities to have collaborative conversations with the Board of Supervisors on these concerns. Thank you in advance for your time and consideration of our members' perspectives and sacrifices as essential workers. Thank you. Next speaker, please. You. Our next speaker will come from the line of Brad Spellberg. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you very much. I'm speaking on item 73A, my name is uh, Dr. Brad Spelberg. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at LA County USC and also the Interim Chief Medical Officer at All of You Medical Center. I want to start by thanking Supervisor Solis and all of the supervisors for the courage and leadership that you've shown in taking on the very difficult problem of vaccinations. It's a controversial topic. We know the vaccines are safe and effective. We also know that for a variety of reasons, some people are not comfortable being vaccinated. I review all new COVID positive tests at both LACUSC and all of you every day. And I can tell you that since the beginning of July, 98% of patients admitted to both hospitals because of COVID have been unvaccinated. This is truly a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Now we've tried and will continue to try to do outreach to provide reassurance and clarify and provide you know facts to, to provide reassurance to folks so they feel Excuse safe me, your time it. has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next speaker will come from the line is now Jose Asuna. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I'll be addressing item number 20 and providing general public comment as well. Uh, my name is Jose Osuna. I serve as housing justice manager for Brilliant Corners, and I am the fourth district appointee for the public safety realignment team. Um, in addressing item number 20, first and foremost, I want to thank Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Solis for presenting this motion, and I urge this board to unanimously support them in this motion. I also want to thank my fellow public safety realignment team members for the work that went into developing this implementation plan and the budget recommendations that go along with it. I support this implementation plan. I think it's a great first step in the county taking a real approach to care first and jails last. I look forward to developing this team into a much more progressive body and a much more community-centered body. Um, I really want to thank the Public Safety Realignment Team for highly ranking all the ODR budget recommendations that go along with this implementation plan, along with a personal thank you on approving a high recommendation for the Breaking Barriers Housing Program, which is under Brilliant Corners. Once again, I want to 
thank this board also for expanding the public safety realignment team to include additional community members, as well as moving forward in allowing this body to have community alternates. I hope other commissions that are under the county structure are able to do this as well. Having community advocates as representative on this team, I think has been transformative. And I look forward to the work that we will be doing in representation of the community. Once again, I wanna thank Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Solis for presenting the motion under item 20. And I urge this board to unanimously support motion uh, under item number 20. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And as a reminder, to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one, then zero on your touchtone phone. Our next participant will be Dr. Chenem Hathus. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm gonna address on item 73A and general public comments. My name is Dr. Chinam Hatuk. I am the Chief Medical Officer for East Valley Community Health Center in West Covina, California. Uh, with the Delta variant infection surging here in LA County and across the US, um, we see it in our clinic. And it's important we take bold and courageous steps to protect not just county employees, but the vulnerable residents we serve. Um, we know that vaccines are safe and effective and they're widely accessible. Uh, by requiring vaccines, we are not only protecting the health and safety of county employees, but our surrounding communities as well. Um, not, and this will also set a strong example to employees in the county and across the nation that LA County is prepared to lead and do the right thing to end this pandemic. I'm calling today in support of the motion ratifying um, Supervisor Solis's executive order requiring county employees to be fully vaccinated by October 1st. And I would like to thank uh, Supervisor Solis for the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we will line of Evet Ail. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Yvette LA with Dignity and Power Now, Justice LA and Reimagine LA, a resident of District 5. I will speak on agenda items 1620 and 73F and general public comment. And I support items 346 and 14 and 23. On uh, item 16, as part of the leadership body of Reimagine LA, I wanna thank the board for your con continued commitment to 2 million LA County voters, but most importantly, your commitment to supporting the most vulnerable people in our communities. You have always had the power to transform the budget. It is your legal right and your duty, regardless of the sheriff's lies and political maneuvering. The sheriff does not care about safety. He cares about maintaining power, and that is perfectly clear by his comments this morning. But through the CFCI advisory body, you are investing in public safety. You are investing in services, housing, youth development, the things we, the people, know actually keep us safe. I want to thank Supervisor Kuehl for amending the motion to include compensation for community members on the body. I sit on multiple county commissions and I can attest to the amount of labor that goes into participating in those bodies. Compensation should be standard for community members across all county commissions. I also wanna urge the board to formalize participatory budgeting as a cent process, as well as the AB 109 budget process. Participatory budgeting was a key recommendation uplifted by community in the Economic Development and Sustainability Subcommittee of Measure J, which I co-chaired along with Dan Langford of the Carpenters Union. Community wisdom is critical to ensuring that a care first vision is not only effective, but innovative. And participatory budgeting would allow for that process. Additionally, I wanna recommend that the CEO rehire Wilson and Associates. Chris's team was fantastic in supporting the community in this process. So I highly urge you all to rehire uh, Wilson and Associates and Chris's team. On agenda item number 20, I wanna thank the board for expanding community participation in the PSRT. I was honored to be part of the PSRT, uh, honored to be working with community members like Jose Osuna, like Marisa, a um, lot of folks that are committed to change and the board's new vision for Care First integrated into AB 109 was critical. For a decade, the PSRT has basically functioned as a rubber stamp for law, the law enforcement budget. But what we saw through the process was over and over again, unanimous support for shifting funds 
to ATI, to ODR, um, and most notably in, in the budget process uh, that we approved um, just, week, just a week ago was for a community set aside of AB 109 budgets and a three-year ramp up to 80% for community of the AB 109 budget. This is transformative. This will save lives. And so I want to commend you all for, for your visionary action in reformatting the PSRT. Um, and also, I want to point out that we're going to have a, a major change for the supplemental budget. And, re and really, in order to implement the PSRT implementation plan, we really need the board and the CEO to also support the budget proposals and the budget recommendations that came out of the PSRT. We can't just give look, lip service to a plan without putting Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Christian Garcia. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Christian Garcia. I'll be speaking on item 73A and general public comment. Um, I'm with El Proyecto del Barrio, the Azusa Health Center. We're a nonprofit community health center, and we first handedly seen the impact that COVID 19 pandemic has had in our community. We've lost valuable clinicians and lost many uh, community members to this virus, and we are very happy and proud to support Supervisor Solis's motion um, requiring over 100,000 county employees to be fully vaccinated. This is a bold move to take action to protect our community, to protect our employees against this virus that has just been devastating our communities. Um, I want to thank the rest of the board for considering this and hopefully ratifying the motion. Um, as we all know, research has shown that vaccines are the most effective method for combating COVID-19 and slowing the spread. So this action is something that is desperately needed, especially with the surge of the Delta variant. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we go to the line of Kara Drake Wyatt. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Kara Drake Wyatt. I'm commenting on um, item 73A and general public comment. I'm an RN at um, LACUSC Medical Center in the Emergency Department, and I would like to thank Supervisor Solis for the motion of the COVID 19 vaccine mandate for LA County employees. I've been fully supportive of this order. Um, LA County is in rising numbers with COVID 19. And it's important to protect our employees as well as our residents. And as far as having the vaccine on board, it'll help out everybody across the board. Um, it's populations who can't get it, like people with autoimmune diseases or people who are pregnant and small children, and people who don't do as well, like the elderly. So at least if we're protected, they know they can come to L.A. County for safe care. Um, I would like to thank the board and hope the board supports this motion. I'm proud to see L.A. County taking steps to slow this pandemic. You know, LA, LA County is usually a usual leader and will be serving, um, we will be a great example. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Brenda Ortega. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I am speaking on item 73A. My name is Brenda Ortega, and I am with Inner City Struggle, a nonprofit organization based in east side of Los Angeles. I am calling in support of the motion ratifying Supervisor Hilda Solis executive order requiring over 100,000 county employees to be fully vaccinated by October 1st. With the new Delta variant rising in LA County and across the US, it's important to take steps to protect the most vulnerable residents in our community by requiring vaccination to all county employees. Not only we are ensuring the health and safety of county employees, many of whom are in public facing roles, but we are reassuring residents that it is safe to access the much needed services the county provides. And this sets a strong example to employers in the county and across the nation that LA County is prepared to lead and do the right thing to end this pandemic. Research has shown that vaccination is the most effective method for fighting COVID and slowing the spread. I am proud to see Excuse LA me, County your time has ready expired. to part. May we have the next speaker, please? I, oh. Yes, thank you. Next, we'll go to the line of Reverend Walter Contreras. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. 
Yes, I am addressing item 73A and general public comment. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Walter Contreras. I am the uh, vice president of NALEC, National Latino Evangelical Coalition, with more than 3,000 congregations. And uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, Supervisor Solis for this motion. And yes, like everyone has said before, I am calling today in support of the motion of ratifying Supervisor Solis executive order requiring that over 100,000 county employees to be fully vaccinated. Uh, the research has shown that vaccination is the most effective method of combating COVID and showing the spread. So at this time, I support uh, that everyone is coming together to look at this in a different perspective and to, uh, to show strong leadership in regards to the pandemic. And I am proud to be part of Los Angeles County and I'm ready to be part and to do what I can in order to support the board and this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to address the board, if you have not done so already, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. Next, we'll go to Dr. Michael Epso. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi there, my name is Dr. Etzel and I'm a psychiatrist at LAC USC Hospital. I'll be addressing uh, the executive order introduced by Chair Hilda Solis, um, S1. So I'm calling today on behalf of my coworkers and fellow union members of CIR and SEIU. We are strongly in favor of the public health order requiring healthcare workers of LA County to get vaccinated. As doctors and scientists, we have worked tirelessly to educate our patients and the community on the effectiveness of the various COVID-19 vaccines and dispel the many harmful myths that have been propagated. The Delta variant is here, it's on the rise, it's everywhere, and LA County has 3 million vaccine eligible and 1 million or 1.3 million ineligible residents who continue to be susceptible to infection or, and are at risk for developing serious symptoms of COVID-19. LA County must continue to ensure the safety of all Los Angelinos. We must continue to protect our community from experiencing another unprecedented surge like that of January 2021. The only way to combat this COVID uh, spread is to get the herd immunity. Vaccines do work and we support the public health order issued by the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Jalaviv Kavuro. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, good morning. This is Dr. Genevieve Clapper. Uh, I'm really hoping that we reopen the board so I can see you, wonderful supervisor, or face and more able to speak. But anyway, on S1, I think you really need to uh, be careful of what you wish. I mean, you know, Dr. Brad Spelberg and as a doctor today, I've told you that the many of the people who are getting sick now are the unvaccinated. And I think, you know, you need to really put a, an effort on that and not penalize the people who are vaccinated. Uh, item 25, again, has been postponed to from January 14, 1920 to August 31, 21. About the board priority, I think that's very important. I think we should know what's going on and we should know what priority the board are really set on. On item 26, again, it's a statute report from LASA, who was due on 10, 1921. And he has been, I mean, he was due on 10, 29-19, and now is pushed back to 10-19-21. It's going to be almost two years. Is the homeless not a crisis? Why two years to get a report? I mean, that's unconscionable. Anyway, I hope you have a wonderful day and week, and hopefully by next month, I can see you in person. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we 
go to the line of Ellen Geisey. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, oh, my name is Ellen Geisey. I'll be addressing on agenda items 3, 4, 6, 14, 16, 20, 23, 27, 20, 73, S in favor for all. And I would like to speak on 14, 20, and 23. I would also like to state before I begin how absolutely irritating and enraging it is to listen to Dina Nueva come on at the beginning of these meetings, get dedicated time ahead of the rest of the public to sit there and gaslight you and continue to spew his absolute bile on all of us. In regards to item 14, again, supporting all of these items, Racism and inequality are woven into the very foundation of Los Angeles, including its infrastructure. Freeway construction has historically and presently occurred in black and brown communities, leading to worse environmental outcomes, such as smog and air pollution, which kills hundreds of people each year. Black children suffer from asthma at much higher rates and are killed in traffic collisions at disproportionate rates. Almost 90% of public transit riders are people of color who bear the brunt of the consequences of the Los Angeles transit system. Anti-racism is a continuous path in a county that was founded on the discrimination of BIPOC Angelinos. It is impossible to separate most of our government services and operations from their past and present racist influence. Anti-racism must be integrated into the fabric of all county operations. Regarding item number 20 and the AB 109 spending, the public safety realignment team's proposed funding recommendations have the potential to reshape the county's approach to incarceration, holistic mental health services, and capacity building for community-based organizations, which, by the way, will tie right back in to helping with the racism issue, as we know that the carceral system and the mental health problems also disproportionately affect BIPOC communities. I would like to thank the supervisors for your leadership in moving LA County forward, a care first future. Toward Excuse today, me, your I time has expired. May we have the next speaker, steps. please? Next, we'll go to the line of James Wheeler. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, I'll be speaking on uh, item 21 and 73 and express our opposition to uh, 16. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm James Wheeler, president of the Association for Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on behalf of nearly 8,000 deputy sheriffs and district attorney investigators on the two motions. We appreciate prioritizing the health and welfare of your workforce there are many aspects of this effort we would like to very much support. We share your concerns about the spreading of the Delta variant in Los Angeles County. Our deputies and our DAIs are among the most exposed of any county worker and we need them protected. <clears throat> we want to convey our early support to Ms. Hahn for her approach that provides for a testing option. To fully support the motion, we need more information about how the testing will be conducted how the mandatory vaccine requirement will be applied, and most importantly, how your board intends to engage these important issues in the collective bargaining process. That's why we appreciate the second part of Ms. Hahn's motion to engage with the county's labor partners. As always, we are standing by to discuss these issues with you, your staff, and our county administrators. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Michael Baylor. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, I'll call him today and check in and see what's going on. Hello, Hello you can begin. Hello, Michael Baylor. Please begin. Thank you. I'll call Henry today. Hello, Michael Baylor, please begin. Your line is open. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Michael Beeler. I'm with the Center for Living and Learning in Van Nuys. I'm a community health worker, and I am calling in support of agenda item number 73F. Um, also, I would like to give comments specifically to um, fully funding the harm reduction, the original map of the advisory board um, presented to the um, to the board. Um, and the reason is, on a personal note, and with clients that I'm working with, um, we currently have one housing resource that is based in harm reduction for a whole community that's in need, and it's not serving the population that our one organization is trying to get to, people who are struggling with substance use disorder and homelessness. Um, a little over a year ago, I was downtown. I didn't even, uh, wasn't even able to get myself a tent. I was so deep into my addiction. And because of harm reduction funds, the Office of Diversion and Reentry, and um, the community that supports this kind of funding, I've been able to turn my life around. Harm reduction offers a bridge to 12-step recovery, to abstinence-based recovery, and it tells people that their health and their well-being, that they're worthy of it, that they deserve it. And, Excuse um, me, your time has expired. The May we have the next speaker, Thank please? You. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Now press one zero second time when you've removed from the queue. Next we will now hear the Spanish data. interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego cero en este momento. No presione uno y cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. May we have the first speaker, please? Yes, next we'll go to the line of Dana Haddle. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I'm calling on item number six. My name is Dana Haddle and I'm with Bateseric Legal Services where I'm the directing attorney of both the Low Income Tax Clinic and the Employment Rights Project. I'm calling today to express our support for Supervisor Solis's recommendation, which would ensure access to the child tax credit and other financial relief. Almost 1 million undocumented immigrants call Los Angeles County home. This is nearly half of California's undocumented population. Despite the significant contributions and sacrifices collectively made by this community throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, they have largely been left out of economic relief. It is imperative that Los Angeles County provide the outreach, education, and assistance necessary so that all those who are eligible for these tax credit programs are provided with the adequate support to take advantage of the state-sponsored economic relief. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. May we have the next speaker, please? Yes, thank you. Next, we'll go to the line of J. Stephen Brentley. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Jay Stephen Brantley. I'm a resident of District 5, and I'll be speaking in support of items 4, 73F, and making general public comment. As a formerly unhoused recovering heroin user who is alive today because of harm reduction, and as someone trained in overdose prevention and reversal, I want to start with 73F. My lived experience makes me grateful for your commitment to a Care First Los Angeles, and it's why I urge you to maintain the original recommendation submitted by the advisory committee to fund the expansion of harm reduction programs at 15 million for the fiscal uh, year of 21-22. Harm reduction providers are confronting the most deadly overdose crisis we have ever seen, and at the same time responding to the pandemic-related needs of our most vulnerable community members, including the unhoused. We must ensure that they're able to continue and expand their life-saving work. Without full investment in harm reduction and agencies like the ODR that support it, the adverse health risks associated with drug use will only worsen. I believe we're at a crucial moment. In light of this week's LA Times fentanyl panic piece, which perpetuates dangerous myths around fentanyl and serves as propaganda for law enforcement and those who would sooner sweep the addicted and unhoused into prisons than provide them with services, it is more important than ever before to support measures that address the underlying needs and causes of use. We know that punitive measures don't work. We wouldn't be in this crisis if they did. So on behalf of those who need and deserve care and dignity and those working for their well-being, I ask that you please maintain the proposed allocation of $15 million for harm reduction services. 
I also want to bring my experience in support of item four. No one should have to spend a decade on the streets as I did in order to understand that the solution to homelessness is homes. The creation of a thousand new FHSP slots to increase turnover at interim facilities would go a long way toward matching more people with the services they need and getting them into permanent housing. This too is harm reduction and a matter of public health. Housing stability and wellness go hand in hand. During a pandemic, quickly transitioning people into permanent housing prevents the spread of infection. More funding for FHSP services means fewer people on the streets. It also means fewer people being removed from our beaches at gunpoint, which if law enforcement is indeed as desperately stretched as Sheriff Villanueva stated earlier, would seem like a win for them too. It means fewer people being chased and hit with non-lethal lethal artillery by police during sweeps in our public parks and fewer people being put in jails where they have even less opportunity to see their needs met and only become more likely to remain unhoused upon release. Please fund the expansion of the FHSP and support exit services for those transitioning from interim housing. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Jasmine Bruzella. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I would like to speak on agenda item four and would also like to speak on general public comment. I strongly support the motion recommended by Supervisor Kuhl and Solely to increase permanent housing by expanding flexible housing subsidy pool. As an associate director in the Flex Pool for Brilliant Corners, I witness firsthand every day what a game changing program the Flex Pool is. At a time when we anticipate confronting an unprecedented inflow into homelessness, once the eviction moratorium ends and the influx of unprecedented federal resources to address this crisis, scaling proven solutions to homelessness like the FHSP is vital to our county's homelessness response. FHSP vouchers are an extremely flexible housing resource, and they have allowed LA County to produce a large number of permanent supportive housing units in the community quickly. What's more, with new federal um, resources, the flexible vouchers have allowed LA County to utilize Federal vouchers win falls more quickly. Our community can swap voucher types with those already housed on flexible housing subsidy pool vouchers for federal vouchers, utilizing the federal time limited resources very quickly. The FHSP also brings other innovations central to the flexibility at the model floor. These subs are often, often faster due to fewer restrictions and requirements to utilize the subsidy. The flexibility of tenant based FHSP vouchers allows higher acuity individuals to take advantage of the existing market to get housed quickly. Not only are participants connected to housing, they are provided with wraparound supportive services that help them thrive. The FHSP also benefits the permanent supportive housing unit pipeline. FHSP vouchers can be committed to new project-based developments to secure additional capital funding and can expedite projects. For property developers, project-based FHSP vouchers provide very important subsidy gap financings and can be layered with the federal tax credit or used independently. And beyond these innovations, the FHSP is built to scale. That's why this motion from Supervisors Kiel and Solis is so timely. I thank them and urge the Board of Supervisors to approve this motion to increase permanent housing by expanding the flexible housing subsidy pool. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Ruby Rivera. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, Hi, please I'm begin. We're at, you know, we want to push forward to have this do, but I can't give you like an update on when this could be. Um, Hello, Ruby. Um, please begin. Your line is open. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruby Rivera. I'm here to speak on item number five. I'm the director of community organizing with Inner City Struggle, and I'm also a tenant in District 2. I'm speaking in support of item five. I am here on behalf of our organization, urging you all to commit to adopting the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. The Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act would give power back to communities and tenants in unincorporated cities across Los Angeles County by establishing new rights, which would create pathways to ownership and prevent the displacement of low income and working class communities of color. Los Angeles is at the epicenter of the housing crisis. As the long-term effects of this pandemic continue to unfold, tenants continue to face the threat of displacement and housing insecurity, while large corporations continue to profit and buy out our communities. 
Comprehensive tenants' rights are needed to give tenants decision-making power and choice in regards to housing and ultimately to preserve and create permanently affordable housing. Gentrification and displacement are not natural. They are the effects of corporate and investor greed that inflict violence and instability onto lower-income communities and turn people into refugees from their own communities. TOPA is a tool that allows people to remain in their communities. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Next to go to the line of Roy Humphreys. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Okay, I'm Roy Humphreys and I'll be speaking on three, four, and general comment uh, on item three is the citizenship waiver. That's a slap in the face to every citizen in the United States of America. And item uh, four as to housing for the uh, homeless, et cetera. Uh, for many, it is a culture and that is difficult to cure at least at best. Uh, put a unit in the Rowan Heights golf course development there and also that each supervisor should be required to have a unit in their neighborhood and NIMBY is not that, not my backyard is not allowed. And uh, general comments, uh, those in charge of, of the Hyperion uh, processing plans should be terminated and criminally charged for wrongful and reckless endangerment. They should have been uh, redundant systems and tested monthly. Uh, if men's jails are torn down before a suitable replacement is complete, the gang of four should be immediately removed from office and criminally charged with aggravated wrongful endangerment and held uh, without bail. And as stated previously, the jail should be removed from the sheriff's purview as per an amendment to the California Penal Code, as previously stated. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next speaker, please. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do wish to address the board, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one then zero a second time, or you'll be removed from the queue. We're going to go to the line of Carolyn Eng. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. <laughs> Hi, this is Carolyn Ng from Hero Christian Health Center. I'm uh, making a general public comment on item 73A. Uh, we are a very small federal qualified health center in the St. Gabriel Valley. And when the scene become available, we saw the need in the St. Gabriel Valley, especially among the underserved with language and technology barrier. And we step up and minister over 35,000 doses in the St. Gabriel Valley. Um, but we witnessed um, that the infection rate among the Asian community is lower uh, during this current Delta variant surge because the vaccination rate among the Asian is very high. So as an educated healthcare provider, we believe that vaccine is safe and effective and it saves lives. We thank and support Supervisor Solid's executive order motion to mandate county employees to be vaccinated. And I urge all of the board to support this motion. You can protect the health and safety of not only county employees, but the families and also everyone in the community. As leader of LA County, you can lead the county by doing the right thing. To Excuse me, your time pandemic. has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we're going to go line of Casey Ventura. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'll be addressing general comment in item number five. So good morning, everyone. My name is Casey Ventura. I am the Director of Land and Tenant Justice at the Beverly Vermont Community Land Trust, representing constituents from the 2nd and 3rd District, as well as the Los Angeles Community Land Trust Coalition. I'm here to speak in support of item number five, which looks into implementing a tenant opportunity to purchase that policy within the unincorporated areas of Los Angeles. As a land trust, our role is to ensure that the needs of long-term residents are met through not just their guidance, but by tenants and residents being at the front of our work. Preserving housing affordability was identified as a high need in these districts, especially while we still fight a pandemic. A model TOPA policy not only offers these points, but also offers an opportunity for ownership an idea that many tenants don't even consider, especially when they are just fighting to afford rent monthly. I commend this board into looking into multiple strategies into not just supporting tenants, but offering a means to create permanent change in their lives through TOPA. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Kathy Garvin. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Um, I want to speak on 73A and in support with some general comment. My name is Kathy Garvin. I'm a nurse at LA County USC in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Over the last year and a half, we had some horrific times and we would like to not go back to those times. We have an abundance of evidence that vaccines are safe and effective. In the emergency department, we're honored to be among the first to receive the vaccine. That have so far declined the vaccine include some of my own friends, colleagues, and family. And I respect their fear and their concerns. However, a partially vaccinated population is a training ground for this virus. Delta is on the rise. The emergency department is filling back up and people will die without vaccines. And I honestly believe that as county employees and as members of society, we have the obligation to protect not only ourselves, our families, but also our community. And at LA County USC, I think we have some of the most vulnerable members of our community. And I truly thank the Board of Supervisors for bringing this motion to our attention, to the public. I thank you for your courage, and I urge you to ratify. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next go to the line of Zach Schlegel. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, I'm calling regarding item number four, which would create a thousand new flexible housing subsidy pool subsidies. Uh, my name is Zach Schlegel, I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy for PATH, People Assisting the Homeless. We believe this is an essential policy as these vouchers are an extremely flexible housing resource, which have allowed LA County to produce a large number of permanent supportive housing units in the community very quickly. It's also a scalable model of vouchers that can be committed to new project-based developments to secure additional capital funding and can expedite new housing units, which are desperately needed. This program offers clear wins for property developers, property managers, and tenants, so we wholeheartedly encourage your support of the item. Thank you for your continued push to address the homelessness and housing crises with multifaceted solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Eric Prey. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, it's Eric Previn, and I will address uh, the items and the general public comment, if that's okay. Thank Please you. Please begin. Um, yeah, I'm going to. Uh, the question about uh, item 21 and the revised um, Directive 3 was interesting because I know that there are certain members of the sheriff's department, I think that union fellow from ALADS, who did not want, he wants to have a collective bargaining meet cute when people are at risk. And, you know, I, but then there was something like 60 days or they would be terminated. Is that accurate? I think that should be clarified because it went by so quickly as Zalval has put together such a stunningly fat agenda full of amazing, great material, including. What a great story with this Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. Finally, we have an assembly of the right kind of new eyes, fresh eyes. We've got Wendy Gruel from uh, Supervisor Kuhl managed to pick her out of the lineup. Uh, this is this is not a great area for for the folks because right now Sheila knows because the brave and leader-like Randall Fraud of Studio City Neighborhood Council has written to them. The yeah. Hollywood Bowl Park Jeanette, Park, falls rather, squarely under the jurisdiction. No, no, Blue, Blue Ribbon Commission needs to look at this, which is the the Hollywood Bowl parking lot is infested with garbage, and it's really bad. And people are, you know, mobilizing and misusing our local public resources to make noise about it. But nonetheless, it has to be taken care of. And so putting together an upscale commission, including Sarah, who we, were, we remember from uh, formerly of Lhasa, Sarah Tso, and Bobby Shriver's uh, you know, campaign helper and David Ruse. These are their usual customers. We can't, we, we're not going anywhere. And, you know, I did not like it when Sheriff Villanueva used the language. Um, he called one of these items a bureaucratic orgy of wokeness. I find that insulting from a man who, frankly, 
you know, ran on some progressive ideas and has been now engaged in a full-scale snit with the county borders, which I have to admit is not hard, but he's got to be more cooperative and um, effective rather than, you know, engaging in a constant battle. It's just, uh, you know, believe me, I know about constant battles. This needs to move forward, and I don't see what's going on in a positive way at the moment. I also think the the meeting schedule really, you know, it's 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 a abhorrent. People know. People can tell what the hell's going on. It's so confusing just to pay attention and listen to the various important members of the public the way you've got it in a one pound pounded free-for-all where everybody is you know, it's like dropping things into the same walk at the exact same moment. It's very hard to focus. So I, I really, I think you need to do a much better job. And it's, you know, I don't like the idea of Fisia Davenport speaking for Nicole Davis Tinkham if she's late to the meeting. She needs to say I'm here herself. You don't say we're both here. If she's Excuse an individual. Excuse me, your time has herself, expired. She's... May we have the next speaker, please? And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do wish to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press 1 then 0 at this time. Do not press 1 and 0 a second time or you will be removed from the queue. Next, we'll go to Sirius Berrios. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'm addressing agenda item 5 and also public comment for the topic. The Tenants Opportunity to Purchase Act would give power back to communities and tenants in incorporated cities across Los Angeles County by establishing new rights, which would create pathways to ownership and prevent the displacement of low-income, working-class communities of color. Los Angeles is the epicenter of the housing crisis. As, as the long-term effects of the pandemic continue to unfold, tenants continue to face the threat of displacement and housing insecurity, while large corporations continue to profit and buy out of our communities. Comprehensive tenants' rights are needed to give tenants decision-making power and choices in regards to housing and ultimately to preserve and cre create permanently affordable housing. The Board of Supervisors have the opportunity to support the Tenants' Opportunity to Purchase Act, which could combat the harmful impact of the speculative housing market in communities that have been historically disinvested, systematically marginalized. As a representative from Trust South LA with 25 years of history in South Central LA and currently operating as an emergency rent assistance provider in incorporated, incorporated areas of Southeast LA County, we witnessed firsthand housing instability our neighbors face. Our communities have been plunged further into rent burden, are harassed by corporate landlords and have little access to purchasing homes in the communities they have built. Voting yes on the study for TOPA will bring us one step closer in addressing histories of redlining this investment and presenting the possibility of tenants becoming future homeowners in their neighborhoods. I would like to share the story of Mr. Gutierrez. He, um, as I've been doing this outreach in our community, he paid his rent during COVID. He paid his bills during COVID. Unfortunately, his landlord passed away. Now, Mr. Um, Gutierrez is being harassed by the heirs and uh, being pushed out of his home without um, illegally. So if we had something in place like this act, Mr. Richardes would have the opportunity to purchase that home that he has lived in for many years. So I uh, encourage the board to please. Excuse me, your time has expired. So that May we have the next speaker, please? Thank you. And next we'll go to the line of Pam Williams. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, I'll be addressing item number 73B and general comment. 73B, I strongly oppose it, is the evaluation of the COVID-19 vaccine requirements for indoor public places. The UNRUH Civil Rights Act, that's the UNRUH Civil Rights Act, prohibits what you are trying to allow businesses to do. The UNRUH Civil Rights Act is an expansive 1950s California law that prohibits any business in California from engaging in unlawful discrimination against all persons, consumers within California's jurisdiction where the unlawful discrimination is based in part on a person's sex, race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, age, disability, medical condition, genetic information, marital status, sexual orientation, citizenship, primary language, or immigration status. The UNRWA Act applies to all businesses in California, including hotels and motels, restaurants, theaters, hotels, barbers, and beauty shops, housing accommodations, and retail establishments. This law was enacted in 1959, and its code 
as the California Civil Code Section 51.3 and 5. So what do you think medical condition equates to in terms of vaccine? The minute you have to ask someone whether they have been vaccinated or not, that is being invasive into what their medical condition is. This law by the California Supreme Court has been repeatedly interpreted as protecting classes other than those listed on its face. And even in 2005, before sexual orientation was added to its list, it was used as a precedent case. So that is what is going to occur should you move forward and allow businesses to discriminate based on who is vaccinated and who is not, which, again, is against constitutional law, the 14th Amendment, separate but equal clauses. Furthermore, the board needs to be transparent in the fact that those people that qualify um, under the American Disability Act and the Rehabilitation Act um, that have disabilities and cannot get the vaccine for whatever the reason may be and have a medical exemption have to be given reasonable accommodations by these businesses or businesses will face lawsuits. This has to occur. Furthermore, what, is, what would you do with people that have children that are too young to get the vaccine? If you let those individuals in with children Excuse that are me, too young to Excuse me, your time has expired. Vaccine, May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we go to the line of Raman Alazari. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Dr. Raman Alazari, a proud LA County employee, uh, senior resident orthopedic surgery at LACUSC, calling today on behalf of my coworkers and you members in favor of um, the Executive Order S1. Um, this is our time. It's, it's time for us to put this to an end. Last year, um, at the height of the pandemic, I and my colleagues on the front line were dealing with um, what I can only describe as absolute horror um, of the pandemic uh, and then all of the unintended consequences. As an orthopedic surgeon, we had to cancel all of our elective surgeries multiple times, and I don't have to tell anyone who's ever had uh, been in the healthcare system or knows someone who had how difficult it is to tell someone that I can't do the knee replacement or can't fix their ACL for another year. It's enough of this. Um, we're all ready to feel safe at work. and feel like we can put this pandemic behind us on a personal note. I'm tired of coming home with God knows what on my clothes or my hands to my pregnant wife and and the potentially transmitting this disease to my unborn child. This is uh, this is getting to the point where it shouldn't be a debate. We have good evidence for the vaccine and it's really it's our only hope. And this is going to be a defining moment for us if we can step up and do this. So um, strong, strong support from uh, from the residents in, in executive order S1 for this vaccine mandate. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go to the line of Veronica Lewis. Please, please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I'll be addressing agenda items 16, 73E, 73F, 20, and general public comment. My name is Veronica Lewis. I'm the director of SSG Hopics, but I'm here today as a part of the Measure J Advisory Committee as a fourth district appointee who also have the honor of being the chair to lead this inaugural process of helping develop the year one spending plan. In relation to the spending plan, I want to thank CEO Davenport, the ATI director, Judge Armstead, and their team for honoring the community driven process. It's evident in the plan before you today that the spending plan our committee prepared was taken seriously, and they worked diligently to incorporate the main pieces of our recommendations. With that said, there are two areas that I want to briefly lift up. Our advisory committee spent hours in marathon meetings week after week to make difficult decisions to reduce down what was originally $800 million of recommendations from the community into 170 million prioritized strategies. As you might imagine, there were several points of disagreement during that process. However, one of the few areas where there was total consensus was the recommended $15 million for harm reduction to fill a huge gap and ultimately save lives. I encourage you to reconsider the $9 million reduction for harm reduction is fully funded. In terms of the new um, Care First Community Investment Committee, many of the hours that our advisory committee um, spent were listening to the community and hearing their hopes, dreams, and concerns. In some cases, our committees received numerous written letters of suggested concerns of suggestions and concerns. In addition, our recommendations very clearly spoke to the challenges of having such an abbreviated time frame to create such a historic document and that voices were left out due to that process. So I applaud your efforts through this motion to address those concerns and create a more thoughtful committee to ensure those groups are heard. A lot of the comments, however, we heard from the community at large, 
felt like they were not, if they were not a part of an organized effort or have the loudest voice, then their opinions did not matter. So given that, I just want to raise one point of caution for your consideration about specifically naming so many of the, um, so many organizations in the actual motion. It appears that the groups who sent the most letters or who have direct access to the Board of Supervisors are the ones named here, which further perpetuates the concern that the community expressed about how people who are not a part of those groups get a voice at the table. In closing, in relation to 73E, 20, and many of the other things here, I want to thank the board for your true commitment to creating a paradigm shift to care first and jails last by adopting these policies and recommendations. Although the current CFCI budget policy only goes through 2026, I hope that with all of the things that are happening, we will see so much transformative change in the next five years that will be ingrained in how LA County does business, addresses equity, treats and serves and supports its residents that we really can find a way to create a sustainable way to have alternatives to incarceration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next we'll go to the line of Jean Krant. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. Good morning, supervisors and members of the public. I'm speaking on agenda item S1 and I'm making a general public comment. I have very grave concerns about the safety of the county's voters, people accompanying them to the polls, such as unvaccinated children, as well as the poll workers that are being asked to work in the upcoming recall election. Many of the chosen polling locations appear unsafe. Many of the locations were chosen before awareness of the science regarding the extreme contagiousness of the Delta variant was known. In some locations, poll workers are being placed at serious risk to their health and lives, being made to work in badly ventilated locations for up to 10 days. Before Delta variant, but during the pandemic period, there was already a lack of adequate COVID protection at county polling places. However, now science tells us the danger of Delta is different and science should not be ignored and I'm urging the board to reevaluate all current polling sites before people head to the polls. The July 30th Wall Street Journal article, How Contagious is the Delta Variant States. Many people infected with Delta carry much higher levels of virus. It's time to rethink our behaviors. Scientists studying COVID-19 say that Delta's increased contagiousness means we need to update our thinking about exposure risks. The old rules of thumb no longer apply, they say, including the conventional wisdom that it takes 15 minutes of close contact with someone to get infected. Here's what scientists we say we need to know now. How much contagious, how much more contagious is Delta compared with older versions of the virus? Delta gets into your cells easier, says a professor from the Colorado State University in, Col in Fort Collins, Colorado. For unvaccinated people, Delta changes the old conventional wisdom that a person is most at risk of infection after 15 minutes of close contact with an infected person. With Delta, infection can likely happen in less than five minutes, scientists say. The variant may even be potent enough to infect an unvaccinated person with a fleeting exposure, such as a minute or two in an elevator. Excuse me, your Dr. time has expired. Mar, may we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Amy Robledo. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address general public comment. You may begin. Hello, good morning. My name is Jamie Robledo. I'd like to speak on item 73A and general public comment. I am a supervising clinic nurse here at LAC USC Medical Center. I'm calling today in support of the motion ratifying Supervisor Solis Executive Order requiring over 100,000 county employees to be fully vaccinated by October 1st. The COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine is safe and effective. Voluntary compliance for county employees has not assisted enough with this global pandemic. As LA County workers, we have a duty and a responsibility to protect the vulnerable patients that we serve and all community members that we serve throughout LA County. Mandated vaccinations is the way to do this. As healthcare workers and public servants, we are demanded to do no harm to all within the county. Unvaccinated employees can spread and cause tremendous harm to the public. By mandating the COVID-19 vaccinations, we are doing our part to further prevent any further harm to any of our employees and our community. Unvaccinated staff who are sick 
will put a work strain on those who have chosen to get vaccinated and we will not have the staffing that is adequate to properly serve our patients who are vulnerable and who are in most need of our care. Thank you for your support in our COVID-19 vaccination efforts and we please, please hope to ratify this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes the one hour of public comment testimony. Thank you so much to everyone that called in and to those of you uh, that uh, were not able to get in, please know that uh, you can still submit your written comments as indicated on our agenda. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during our meeting, which will become part of the official record. And again, I wanna thank everyone for calling in. Uh, it's, very, it's very important. Uh, Madam Executive Officer, please indicate the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting. The following items are before you. <clears throat> 1D, 1, 1D through 5D, 1P and 2P, 1 through 3, 5 as revised, 17 through 13, 15, 17 through 20, 22 through 24, 27 through 53, 55 through 72, 73D, 76 and 77. Thank you. Move by. Myself and seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve these items. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, members. Today we'll begin with the set item S1, followed by the items 73A, 21, 73B, 4, 6, and 14, and then item 16, 73E, and 73F, which will all be taken up together and finishing off with item 73C. So members, let us begin with set item S1. This is on the public health order. This is the public opportunity to hear the board discuss the uh, closures and pandemic trends. We will now hear from Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health and Dr. Parker, I believe, or you know, Dr. Is Dr. Galley back? Dr. Galley's back. I'm sorry, Dr. Galley, thank you, uh, our Director of Health Services. So with that, you may begin, Dr. Ferrer. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Supervisor Solis, and to the entire Board of Supervisors. As always, I'd like to express my and the department's sincere appreciation for your support and tireless advocacy and leadership. Hello, Dr. Ferrer. Dr. Ferrer, we can't hear you. We momentarily lost Dr. Ferrer, so perhaps we could start with Dr. Christina Galley. Dr. Galley? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, supervisors. Uh, I'll share just a little update today about vaccination status testing and hospitalizations within the Department of Health Service Hospitals. And if you'll turn to the slides, on slide two, is a brief summary of the progress on vaccinations. DHS continues to offer multiple access points for our workforce, for our patients, and for the community. Obviously, we have seen a flattening in the curve as interest in the vaccines has waned over the last several weeks and months. We continue to use multiple tactics, one-on-one -on -one conversations, town halls, multi-modality communications to be able to address the various sources of vaccine oh, hesitancy so and work toward vaccination. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. On the next slide, you can see the progress in vaccinating the, the community that is experiencing homelessness, persons experiencing homelessness. And again, 
Our progress has slowed, but our street outreach teams through Housing for Health, as well as through a number of other organizations across the county are out on the streets every day, working with individuals who are on the streets and shelters and encampments and in various interim and permanent supportive housing units to be able to talk to them about the vaccine. To date, over 7,500 persons experiencing homelessness have uh, received the vaccine and, over, and nearly 2,000 staff who serve individuals on the streets have been fully vaccinated. On the next slide, slide four, you'll see the progress for vaccinating individuals who are currently in the LA County jail system. All individuals in the jail, as well as all youth in the juvenile uh, court system are offered the vaccine. The uptake rate has dipped below 50%. It's currently sitting around 42%, and that's the acceptance rate of individuals for the vaccine. They're offered it on intake into the jail and at multiple other points during their stay. I'll shift now to briefly talk about hospitalizations on slide five. We have had a steady climb up over the past month in individuals who are considered COVID-19 inpatients within the DHS, the four DHS hospitals. You'll see that as of two days ago, our numbers were in the upper six in the upper 60s. And this morning, uh, our census of COVID-19 inpatients is at 73. This represents the highest point since the winter surge. However, we are still at only a small fraction, less than 15% of our COVID census that we experienced over the winter. I'll, on the next slide, slide six, I wanna go into a little bit more detail about the data of what we're seeing and who is admitted to the hospital with COVID. Since mid-June, DHS has cared for nearly 300 patients who are considered to be a COVID-19 admission. This is defined as someone with a positive COVID test during their stay or any positive COVID test in the 30 days leading up to their stay or someone with an ICD-10 diagnosis for a coronavirus infection. That distinguished distinction though, doesn't necessarily differentiate between someone who is in the hospital for COVID, i.e. due to the complications from the virus itself versus just simply who is someone who has had COVID or recently had COVID, but is in the hospital for something else, for a car accident, for cancer treatment, or for something else. So when we dive into the details of these cases, of these nearly 300 individuals over the past two months, only five people were fully vaccinated and admitted to the hospital due to COVID infection and the complications of COVID. Of these five individuals, one was severely immunocompromised and was a transplant patient. All of the remaining, more than 95% of all of the people admitted for COVID were among those patients who were not fully vaccinated. And I think this underscores really the key point that the vaccine saves lives. It reduces the risk of infection. It reduces the risk of spreading the virus to others. And critically in doing so, it reduces the risk of those individuals serving as a Petri dish really in which the virus can continue to mutate into progressively more dangerous forms that put everyone at risk. As healthcare providers, many of whom in public comment you heard from this morning, including several DHS staff, I hear often about how it's really emotionally difficult and challenging to care for patients who have COVID and complications of COVID who haven't chosen to get vaccinated because it really is an avoidable and preventable situation. I'll shift now to the next slide on testing. You can see on this slide, slide seven, the dots showing all of the locations in which people can receive community-based testing access. There's a variety of testing locations offered by the city, the county, uh, as well as a number of additional community partners. Testing is widely available. As you'll see on slide eight, we have fixed testing sites and pop-up testing sites. The utilization rate, which historically had been running around 10 or 15%, has climbed up over the past couple of weeks, but still all of our fixed and pop-up testing sites are still running at less than 50% utilization rate. The percent positivity among all tests that are being offered at the fixed and pop-up testing sites has also increased. Uh, over the course of the last several weeks and months and is in the range of five or six to 9% and it varies by site. 
We will continue to offer those community-based testing sites as a resource to the community. I know there's a lot of other locations that are available for the community to be able to get tested at, including various locations at schools, uh, through business locations, and obviously through the established provider system. So there's many locations in which people can get access to a coronavirus test if they need one. And I would encourage anyone who has symptoms of COVID and anyone who's been in close contact with someone with COVID, particularly if you're not fully vaccinated, to consider getting a COVID-19 test. Uh, and with that, I will close, but happy to answer any questions you might have. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Galley. Now we will go back to Dr. Barbara Ferrer for her presentation. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, good morning and thank you Supervisor Solis and to the entire Board of Supervisors. As always, I'd like to express my and the department's sincere appreciation for your support and tireless advocacy and leadership. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present to you and the public the latest on the status of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic here in LA County. This morning, I'll be talking about our trends in cases, hospitalizations and deaths by vaccination status, age group, and race and ethnicity. I'll also provide an update on vaccine delivery and outreach, some background on vaccine efficacy and safety, and information on vaccine mandates in our state and county. I can go to this first slide. Uh, yesterday's numbers, which are on this slide, represent a lag in the weekend reporting. I just got today's numbers, and I'm sad to report 22 additional deaths today. This does bring the total number of deaths to 24,805 across the county. We share our deepest condolences with all those who are grieving the loss of friends, loved ones, and family, and we wish you healing and peace. We're also reporting 2,622 new cases today, bringing the total number of cases in LA County to 1,331,859. Yesterday, our daily average case rate without the seven day lag was 24 cases per 100,000 people. This is a small increase from last Tuesday's same day case rate of 21 new cases per 100,000 people. Although yesterday's rate will likely change somewhat over the coming days as additional test results are reported, this does suggest to us that once again, we have a slight rise in our case numbers. To date, more than 7.5 million people have been tested and had test results reported in LA County. I want to note that as schools and institutes of higher education return to session and their routine screening testing programs come back online, we expect to see, to see tens of thousands more test results each day. And in parallel with these, we will see an increase in our cases. Our daily test positivity was 4.4% yesterday. And that's a decrease of more than two full percentage points from last Tuesday's same day test positivity rate of 6.6%. Yesterday, there were 1,437 people hospitalized with COVID-19. And over the last week, that's an increase of 164 people. We also have 239 open investigations at residential congregate settings and non-residential settings with at least one confirmed case of COVID-19. That's a doubling of our outbreak investigations in a month. We can take the next slide. Three weeks ago, at the time of uh, our health officer order that required universal masking indoors, our cases were doubling every 10 days. What we're seeing now is a slowing down in the increase in cases, which is what we would hope for after implementing an effective public health measure. This does remind us all that masking remains an effective way to reduce transmission. It's also valuable to compare trends in LA County with those in the rest of the state after our county became the first county to implement an indoor masking requirement on July 18. When we compare cases that were reported in the week ending August 1st with those that were reported in the week ending August 8th, LA County went from seeing 19,704 19, cases to seeing just under 21,000 cases. That was an increase of about 6.5%. Meanwhile, across the remainder of the state, reported cases went from about 40, 46,000 in the week ending August 1st 
to 55,422 in the week ending August 8th, and that was an increase of over 20%. Although there are many reasons beyond masking contributing to this threefold difference in the rate of increase between the county and the rest of the state, uh, data from around the world and from our county have repeatedly shown that masking is a valuable layer of protection against transmission of respiratory viruses. And we're grateful to everyone who's doing their part by masking up to help slow the spread. I'll take the next slide. I'll now share with you some data on COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by vaccination status, all of which help illustrate why we place such high priority on vaccinating as many LA County residents as we can, as quickly as we can. This graph shows our case numbers by vaccination status from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, well, really, this actually just shows it from January 1st uh, through uh, July 24th of this year. As you can see, uh, near the end of June, cases in unvaccinated people have risen faster and higher than they have among vaccinated people. Of the approximately 2,000 cases identified daily in late July, about 1,500 cases, or three quarters of the cases, were among vaccinated residents. It's worth noting that when there are high rates of community transmission, the risk of infection increases most for unvaccinated individuals but fully vaccinated individuals also have an increased chance of coming into contact with an infected person because there are more infected people circulating. We'll go on to the next slide. We're finding that different age groups have different case rates, likely as a consequence of the social mixing or the mixing at work that leads to transmission. This slide shows case rates between May 1st and July 24th of this year by age group and vaccination status. Here, case rates among unvaccinated people are represented by the orange lines, while rates among vaccinated people are in green. Rates in adults between the ages of 18 and 49 are represented by solid lines, and rates in adults age 50 and over are represented by dash dash lines. Note how dramatically case rates differ by both, both by vaccination status and by age group. The highest rates are among unvaccinated or partially vaccinated adults between the ages of 18 and 49. That's represented by that solid orange line. The next highest case rates are among unvaccinated or partially vaccinated older adults, represented by the dashed orange line, and below them, vaccinated younger and older adults in the solid and dashed green lines, and they have the lowest rates. While younger adults tend to have higher transmission levels than older adults, vaccinated people in all age categories have fewer cases per 100,000 people than do unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people. Next slide. If we look at cases by pediatric age groups, you can see that the age group with the lowest rates of transmission continues to be children between the ages of zero and four, represented here by the blue line. Cases are rising faster and to higher levels among older children. Children aged 5 to 11, represented by the orange line, and those aged 12 to 17, represented by the green line, have similar case rates. Looking back at the distribution of cases among these age groups during our wintertime surge, you can note that children in the oldest age group, 12 to 17, had rates quite a bit higher than those of younger children. With older children currently the only pediatric age group eligible for vaccines, we are now seeing transmission within this older age group substantially diminished. Although they're not shown here, case rates in vaccinated children younger than 18 are lower than the lowest line on this graph, while case rates in unvaccinated children track closely with rates in vaccinated adults aged 18 to 49. We'll take the next slide. On this next slide, we can look at information on hospitalizations by vaccination status. As you can see, the difference between the numbers of unvaccinated and vaccinated people hospitalized is much larger than we were just looking at cases. In late July, about 94 people newly admitted to the hospital each day were positive for COVID. Of these, 83, or slightly under 90%, were unvaccinated. We can take the next slide. When we look at who is now getting hospitalized by age group, we can see that the highest hospitalization rate 
is among older unvaccinated adults, represented here by the dashed orange line. These are our highest risk residents because of their age, likelihood of having comorbidities, and lack of vaccine protection. And sadly, hospitalizations in this group are rising very quickly. Hospitalizations in younger unvaccinated adults represented here by the solid orange line are also rising. Relative to these trends, hospitalization rates among vaccinated adults of all ages remain, as you can see, nearly flat, even among those older adults. Without vaccination, the orange lines on this graph would likely be, likely be 60 to 100% higher. So we are extremely grateful to everyone who has helped reduce potential transmission by getting vaccinated. Trend lines like these are why we feel so certain that the vaccines are doing exactly what they're supposed to do here in LA County. Vaccinated people are exceptionally well protected from hospitalization. And while we've seen cases rise among vaccinated people, far fewer vaccinated people experience the severe illness the infection continues to cause in unvaccinated people. This is why we continue to ask everyone eligible to get vaccinated because we know that we can prevent almost all COVID hospitalizations and deaths. If everyone, were, if everyone eligible were to get vaccinated, we would end up avoiding so much of the anxiety and distress that comes with having a loved one hospitalized with COVID, and almost no one would pass away from this infection. This is an achievable reality for us if everyone who's eligible gets vaccinated. Next slide. Again, zooming in on the pediatric age groups, you can see that hospitalizations remain relatively low, but they are increasing very slightly in all age groups. You can also note that although rates are low, the pattern that has been present throughout the pandemic is still in effect. Hospitalizations end up being highest among the youngest children age zero to four, represented by the blue line, lower among children age 12 to 17, represented by the orange line and lowest in children five to 11 here on the green line. I wanna note that the absolute numbers here are generally in the single or low double digits. So these small changes in the numbers result in a relatively large increase in the rates. We can go on to the next slide. Because we're very interested in understanding how well vaccination protects against severe outcomes due to COVID, we're also closely following differences in deaths between fully vaccinated and non-fully vaccinated people. In people who die of COVID in LA County, an average of 37 days pass between the date of diagnosis and the date they unfortunately pass away. With our case increase having begun relatively recently, it's therefore too early to fully assess the impact of this latest wave of infection on COVID death rates. Nevertheless, I do wanna show you what we know about deaths due to COVID by vaccination status. As the slide shows, between April 1st and July 24th of this year, 94% of all COVID deaths among LA residents, this was 588 people that sadly passed away, took place in unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people. And there were 41 deaths, about 6% among fully vaccinated people. Many of the fully vaccinated individuals that sadly passed away from COVID had serious comorbidities and or compromised immune systems. We'll take the next slide. Given the increased evidence that fully vaccinated people are getting infected, we do continue to share information each week on vaccine effectiveness and how to use this information to best keep ourselves and others safe and to get back to slowing transmission. This slide shows data for those fully protected by the vaccines to scale. The large green box that you've seen before represents now the more than 5.1 million residents who are fully vaccinated. The tiny purple box in the lower left corner of this box represents the 15,628 fully vaccinated people who tested positive for COVID as of August 3rd, 2021. This equates to less than 1% of all those who are fully vaccinated testing positive for COVID-19. Of those who tested positive, 446 were hospitalized. That's up slightly from 410 the week prior. This translates to 0.009% of all fully vaccinated people. Deaths in this group over this interval also increased very slightly from 35 to 41. And that meant that we're now at 0.0008% of fully vaccinated people 
uh, tragically pass away. These small increases, while indicative that fully vaccinated people do become inv infected, and that more have become infected during the summer, summer surge than before, they still provide compelling evidence that fully vaccinated people remain at low risk for becoming infected and even lower risk for having a bad outcome if they are infected. We'll take the next slide. Given this high rate of community transmission, our vaccination efforts remain critically important to reducing the impact of rising infection on our residents. As of August 6, we've administered nearly 11.3 million doses to residents 12 and older, including nearly 6.3 million first doses and more than 5 million second doses. Overall, 72% of LA County residents 12 and over have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 62% are fully vaccinated. For residents 65 and older, 80% are fully vaccinated. For teens 12 to 17, the rate of vaccination unfortunately is lower with 45% fully vaccinated. We'll go to the next slide. We do continue to see consistent increases in, in vaccination over the last few weeks. Uh, between July 26 and August 1st, we administered over 81,000 doses across the entire county network. This again is an, another increase of more than 7,000 from the previous week. We're deeply grateful to everyone in the county who's contributing to our collective health by getting vaccinated. And we're deeply grateful to all our vaccination partners. Now is a particularly critical time for us to increase vaccination uptake. And we're always uh, thankful that we see signs that we're moving in the right direction. Next slide. With these increases in vaccination countywide, we're now seeing bands of higher vaccination rates represented by the dark green on this map across the Southern and Western neighborhoods of the city in parts of the San Fernando Valley and East LA and beyond. In the last two weeks of July, nearly every city and community in the county had an increase in vaccination coverage. 40% of the cities and communities with the biggest leaps upward were in Central and South Central LA. All of LA County thanks you for doing your part to slow the spread. We can go to the next slide. Although we do continue, as you can see here clearly, have large gaps in vaccination between age and racial and ethnic subgroups, there are promising upticks in many of the groups with lower vaccination coverage. The numbers on this slide are now color coded, so you can see the changes in the past week. Proportions that increased by one point over the past week are listed in blue. Those that increased by two are listed in green, and those that increased by three are listed in pink. Proportions that did not change at all are in white. And the good news is that we are not seeing a lot of white, particularly amongst younger age group. However, as you can quickly see, disproportionalities remain, especially among teens and young adults. Uh, among our teens, about one third to one half as many black and Latinx teens, and about two thirds to three quarters as many white and American Indian Alaska Native teens have been vaccinated as their Asian counterparts. Fortunately, with the start of school to school year approaching, we have seen, as you noticed, uh, sizable increases in vaccination across all racial and ethnic subgroups among our teens. Meanwhile, among young adults 18 to 29 and 30 to 49 years old, we also saw increases across most racial and ethnic subgroups in the past week. And we're hoping that these rates become more comparable in the near future. If you look at the numbers by overall age group running across the bottom of this table, you'll notice that all age groups, with the exception of 12 to 15 year olds, are now vaccinated at a rate 62% or higher. And this again is a great step forward toward community immunity. Uh, we're also gratified, as we noted earlier, that so many seniors are protected by vaccines. Uh, looking at the totals in the rightmost columns, you can see that the groups with the highest rates of transmission, hospitalizations, and deaths continue to have the lowest rates of vaccination. As high levels of transmission persist, we remain very concerned about the low levels of vaccination among our Black residents and other teen and young adults. However, we're hopeful that the increases we're seeing on this chart will continue to add up until we see high rates of vaccination coverage across the board. Meanwhile, the best way for us to reduce community transmission while we're improving vaccination coverage 
is for everyone to comply with the indoor masking requirement. Slowing transmission not only protects vulnerable unvaccinated residents, including all of our children under the age of 12, it also reduces the chances of more mutations that can result in more infectious variants that can evade our vaccine protection. Next slide. Because vaccination is such a critical part of protecting our hardest hit communities, we're targeting additional outreach in communities that are newly experiencing high levels of transmission. Our community health worker teams have added focused outreach in some of these areas in recent weeks, and this includes Venice Studio City and Beverly Hills. And these, in, these efforts will continue over the coming weeks. We can go on to the next slide. And as our county's children begun, begin returning to school this month, we're also partnering with school districts to increase access to vaccines. High schools and middle schools are planning more than 135 vaccine events in August. Many are occurring during student registration sessions in the first half of the month. These events are open to students, staff, teachers, parents, and in many instances, community residents. This map shows the schools where these vaccine events are taking place, and you can see that it's widely distributed. Because vaccination is such an important part of our strategy for keeping schools safe, we encourage everyone eligible for a vaccine to attend one of the school events if you or your teen is not yet vaccinated. If you're that, they can reach out to us. That our mobile vaccination teams reach unvaccinated people in the neighborhoods where they live and work. Teams are making nearly 400 visits countywide. Uh, you can also reach out to us to request a mobile team at your place of work or in your community by just going to the website vaccinatelacounty.com. Uh, next slide. While there's relatively high compliance with indoor masking requirements at most establishments, with increased community transmission, we continue to see a rise in outbreaks at places where people work or live in close quarters. Last week, we opened 22 worksite outbreaks, 10 outbreaks among homeless facilities, and five in food facilities. We also had smaller numbers of outbreaks across schools, correctional settings, and houses of worship. Prior to our latest increase in infections, the last time we saw upward trending rates at these levels was back in late September of 2020. But at that time, uh, outbreaks stayed at these levels before they started rising dramatically in November and December, something we hope we will not see. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide. Although we've also had outbreaks uh, in our school nursing facilities and long-term care facilities where we have high rates of vaccination, you can see that these have risen so much more slowly than outbreaks at other sites. Last week, we saw five skilled nursing facility outbreaks and 10 outbreaks in other long-term care residential, long-term care and residential settings. While these numbers are not high, they are beginning to creep a little bit. And they suggest that even with widespread vaccination and PPE use, healthcare settings are not immune from outbreaks, particularly if unvaccinated healthcare providers Dr. Ferrer, are you still there? I think we may have lost her. Again. We're going to try to get get her back. Dr. Ferrer? Hello? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Ferrer. You're back. Okay. okay. Um, can you hear me on? Okay. I'm, I'm going to hang up on the computer so that you don't get an echo. Okay.
Um, okay, I'm going to go on to cases uh, in among healthcare workers. I think that might be where I where you lost me. Uh, healthcare workers, uh, as everyone knows, have been among the highest risk populations for COVID infections since the beginning of the pandemic. As PPE became more widely available and vaccination increased amongst these workers, we saw their infection rates decline earlier this year. However, with increased community transmission, we're now seeing transmission rise again. Between July 25th and the 31st, 268 healthcare workers and first responders tested positive for COVID. We know healthcare workers are not uniformly vaccinated and while consistent use of respirators and other PPE reduces the likelihood of transmission within healthcare settings, these workers are still at risk of being infected in their communities when community transmission is high. The trend lines on this slide, and we can go on to the next slide, show the settings where healthcare workers with COVID have worked over the course of the pandemic. And during the surge, the highest numbers of infected healthcare workers were working in hospitals. And that's the same in this past week. Uh, nearly half of all of the infected healthcare workers are working in our hospitals. An additional 47 work in skilled nursing or long-term care facilities. 23 are in outpatient facilities. 43 work in EMS as first responders or in corrections. And 16 worked in home health uh, with 147 working across all of the other healthcare settings. While cases among healthcare workers remain relatively low, they are concerning because many healthcare workers have close contact with very vulnerable patients. It's therefore of particular importance to prevent infection in our healthcare workers. The better protected they are, the safer are the vulnerable people to whom their care is so important, and the easier it is to ensure that our healthcare facilities are able to remain fully staffed during the pandemic. We'll go on to the next slide. Given the need to protect healthcare workers and the populations they care for, the state has issued several health officer orders over the past two weeks with the goal of preventing COVID transmission within healthcare facilities. On July 26th, the state issued a health officer order mandating testing for most healthcare workers. This healthcare order requires validation of vaccination status by healthcare facilities and then for all unvaccinated employees respiratory protection with medical grade masks or ideally respirators and testing once or twice a week is required depending on the facility type. This health officer order took effect yesterday and it also imply, applies to individuals employed at jails, homeless shelters and senior care facilities. On August 5th, the state issued a second health officer order mandating healthcare worker vaccination with two doses by September 30th with exclusion only for qualified medical reasons or religious exemptions. And then there's a testing requirement for those with approved exemptions. Most individuals working in healthcare facilities are covered by this order. Meanwhile, until September 30th, the July 26th order remains in effect, requiring, as of today, uh, testing for unvaccinated workers. Also on August 5th, the state issued a health officer order mandating that visitors to health facilities, including visiting staff, uh, show proof of full vaccination or of a negative test result in the prior 72 hours uh, upon visitation. This applies at acute care hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, and intermediate care facilities. This order also mandates masking regardless of vaccination status and recommends a medical grade or double mask be used. Our state is not the only entity manda mandating vaccines. Vaccine mandates have been issued by private employees, including hospitals and large corporations. Universities throughout the state have also issued vaccine mandates as have uh, local and uh, statewide and other uh, city and county governments uh, across the country. Yesterday, officials in Washington state announced the vaccination mandate for all state workers and healthcare workers. Many countries now require vaccine proof to enter. Next slide. In a healthcare order we intend to issue later this week, we will align with the state in mandating vaccination for healthcare workers in our county by September 30th. Our order will also include three additional groups of healthcare workers, 
emergency medical technicians and paramedics, home health care workers, and dental practice employees. Over the coming weeks, we'll work collaboratively and closely with our healthcare and labor partners to develop an effective education and implementation strategy. And we thank everyone for their assistance with this. You can go to the next slide. We favor COVID vaccination for everyone eligible because of the mounting evidence that these vaccines are effective and safe and provide the most powerful tool for ending the pandemic. In a study conducted in the United Kingdom during their surge of Delta variant infections, Pfizer vaccines were found to reduce symptomatic disease due to COVID by 88%. During a wave of Delta variant infections in Israel, the vaccine reduced hospitalizations and severe illness there by 93%. In Colorado, as Delta strain spread, state, spread, spread statewide in May and June, vaccination was estimated to reduce symptomatic disease by 89% statewide. We're also seeing signals that vaccination is far more protective against Delta variant infection than a previous infection is. In a study conducted recently among residents in Kentucky that had been infected at an earlier point in time, unvaccinated people had more than two times greater chance of a repeat COVID infection than vaccinated people did. We have so much data showing how safe these vaccines are. 346 million doses of COVID vaccines have been given in the United States so far. And the CDC and FDA have monitored all of them for adverse effects. As a result of this careful monitoring, three very rare and treatable health effects of these vaccines have been noted. One, anaphylaxis is a rare allergic reaction that occurs within 30 minutes of taking the vaccine and it happens with these, va these three vaccines as well as a host of other medications. Another is a syndrome involving blood clots and low platelets that has affected a very small number of women aged 18 to 49. This very uncommon event is also treatable. A third adverse effect seen, in, seen very uh, infrequently in young men in the days after receiving the second dose of vaccine is inflammation of heart tissues. This can also be treated without any medication. These health problems are extremely rare side effects of the vaccine. What's more common are the expected vaccine side effects, which usually manifest as one to two days of flu-like illness. Many people have these side effects, but they're manageable with over-the-counter fever-reducing medication, and they go away without additional treatment. These are the facts that come to us from both government and non-government studies but they can be hard to access when misinformation about vaccines is everywhere. For people without good access to high quality health information they feel they can trust, it can be very hard to find the truth. Everyone can help by pointing people with questions towards accurate information. Our website is a good place to start. From our COVID page, you can now click vaccine on the blue bar across the top and then click misinformation and check your facts about some of the most common vaccine rumors. Talking with your health provider is also a great option for those with questions and concerns. Go on to the next slide. We do continue to have high transmission of COVID in LA County. Were we back in the days of having a blueprint, we'd be back in the purple tier. But we also have many strategies for managing the spread of this infection. The more of these we use, the safer we all are. Think about it this way. Someone who wears a seatbelt, drives at a safe speed, and has airbags is safer than someone who, who does only one of these things. In some ways, it's the same as using multiple prevention strategies to protect all of us uh, from COVID. For primary prevention, that's what we call reducing the risk of transmission, we have several important tools of which vaccinations are by far the most powerful. Diet, that is why we're working so hard to ensure barrier-free access to vaccination. And we roll out mobile vaccination teams, school vaccination events, and collaborations with so many vaccination partners countywide. This is also why we favor targeted vaccination mandates, since this is the tool that offers us the most protection from spread of COVID. So many heartaches can be prevented if those eligible for vaccination get their vaccines. High rates of vaccination allow us to remain fully open and they protect those not yet eligible or able to get vaccinated. 
Because unfettered transmission threatens our recovery, we also need to use masking, distancing, and infection control to blunt the spread of the virus. Universal indoor masking provides an additional level of protection to both unvaccinated and vaccinated people. While distancing where possible helps avoid the crowding that can facilitate transmission. And infection control practices like hand washing and disinfecting surfaces continues to reduce the spread of the infection through hand to mouth or nose contact. We also have mitigation measures, which we sometimes call secondary prevention. These are aimed at identifying new cases and stopping that chain of transmission. And a key element here is testing. And as Dr. Galley noted, frequent testing of people at high risk for infection or who have symptoms helps us identify potential spreaders of an infection early. And it provides opportunities to educate how people can keep themselves safe and their households safe should they be infected. And finally, our isolation and quarantine practices help us prevent spread through what doctors call source control, temporarily restricting infected people from coming into contact with others until they're no longer at risk for transmission. All of these strategies are necessary right now. Getting fully vaccinated is the best protected action, protective action all of us can take. And during this time of high transmission of a very infectious variant, we can take care of each other by also wearing masks indoors and layering on these other preventive strategies whenever possible. Every action helps, and we're so grateful to all of you who continue to do your part during these challenging times. Thank you again, supervisors, for your tremendous leadership, and I'm available to respond to your questions. Thank you uh, so very much to, to you. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties we had there, Dr. Ferrer, and thank you, no Dr. Problem. Christina Galley, for uh, giving us a great great presentations again. Um, I wanna begin and then I will turn to my colleagues and the order of which I'll recognize them is Supervisor Hahn, Supervisor Mitchell, Supervisor Kuehl, and I believe if uh, Supervisor Barter has any questions. And we're gonna go uh, on this one, uh, S1, we're gonna, we're gonna deliberate on that. This is a receiving file but we can have our discussion and then we'll move on to uh, item 73A. So um, I just have three questions. Uh, Dr. Ferrer, I'm, I'm really happy that um, we've been able to see that uh, our, our rates, our case rates are, aren't, as, aren't quickly moving up as they were in the past. And I do believe the credit goes to the masks wearing and uh, really um, seeing in the last two weeks, I think a large number of people are now getting vaccinated. Uh, and, and just a question I have is how long do you expect cases to continue to increase before they decline? And how high would you expect them to go before a downturn? It's a great question. And, and thank you so much for all your support, Supervisor Solis. Um, well, one issue that's going to confound uh, our case numbers is that we're going to be dramatically increasing testing uh, across the county as, as all of our schools are reopening and our universities and, and colleges are welcoming back their students and faculty as well. Many of these sites have uh, regular screening testing. Uh, many of them have a testing requirement upon entry. Um, and that means uh, that we'll have tens of thousands of more people getting tested every day. And even though with that, um, you know, more routine screening testing that happens, the test positivity rate will, will be very low. It, it will add cases, and uh, we're you know we're always glad, uh, as I've said since the beginning of this pandemic, to have people tested and identified early on as positive for COVID, because that means that we can isolate them and quarantine their close contacts and cut that chain of transmission. But it does mean for the months of August and September, we're likely to see our case numbers climb. Uh, the hope here will be that our test positivity rate does not. Uh, indicating that much of what we're seeing is a result of increased testing, um, but it still will indicate to all of us that we have widespread transmission. So I imagine that for the months of August and September, we will continue to need uh, everyone who isn't vaccinated to get vaccinated as quickly as possible and to add uh -huh. of, you know, of mitigation uh -huh. uh, that we're protecting each other from all of this transmission. And, and Dr. Ferrer, just briefly also, um, 
you know, you you indicate that um, you know the cases of, of getting really ill from this new variant are lower with people that have been vaccinated. But I think we're also being hurt by the media and others reporting that these are somehow, uh, you know, really tremendous that they are that they are going up, and that that for some reason is alarming the public. And I I think it's almost dissuading people when I when I'm out in the field, telling me that well you know I had COVID and I don't need it and by the way people are still getting it now even if they've been vaccinated. So how how are we going to really be able to message that now as we are going into, you know, we're already in August, but September, how can we help break through that? I, I think, you know, just uh, continuing as, as we try to share accurate information. Um, if you look at everybody who's vaccinated, your chances of ending up positive are less than 1%. So that, I mean, that's the first thing that's important to note that if you get vaccinated, you got a lot of protection. You're highly unlikely to even get infected. If you do get infected, very few people end up in the hospital and very, very few people end up passing away. The numbers are, are very small. They're tragic, but they're very, very small. If you don't get vaccinated, your chances of getting infected are four times greater and your chances of ending up hospitalized should you get infected, I think are 19 times greater, either 19 or 20 times greater. Uh, and obviously, you have a much greater chance of passing away since 96%, 95 to 96% of the people who are passing away right now are people who are not vaccinated. Um, so I, I think um, while it is true that these vaccines are not 100% perfect, no vaccines are and, as, you know, no medications are. Um, and if you look at sort of the risks and the benefits, I think it's so clear that getting vaccinated um, not only protects you, protects our community, and it's really uh, the most efficient way for us to end this pandemic at this point. Thank you. And just last question, uh, you know, with schools starting now in different parts of the county and next week, LA Unified School District is starting and they're gonna be asking children to wear masks and staff to also mask and test. What message do we have for parents and for faculty and students as we move ahead, given that we're seeing uh, an increase in, in youngsters that aren't eligible for, the, for any of the vaccinations? I mean, for all of us who care deeply about young children under the age of 12 who cannot get vaccinated, the most important gift we can give them is to get vaccinated ourselves if we're eligible. Because that's what we mean when we talk about community immunity. We mean we surround those that cannot get vaccinated with everyone else being vaccinated. So one thing to just note for everyone who's deeply concerned about children not being able to get vaccinated, uh, we can all do our part by making sure we're getting vaccinated. That adds a lot of layers of protection, including in your own homes. Um, so, you know, it's much less likely for there to be transmission from vaccinated people to unvaccinated people, not impossible, but much less likely from unvaccinated people to unvaccinated people. So please, parents, teenagers, if you live in a household with somebody under the age of 12, if you get vaccinated, you're providing them with a lot of protection as well. And then we have been working with the schools, um, you know, really for months now on layering in uh, additional protections that can happen at school. You know, starting with that universal masking requirement indoors, distancing where possible and feasible, crowd, you know, avoiding crowded situations. We have um, good strategies in place once cases get identified through that uh, routine screening so that we'd be able to quickly isolate and identify close contacts. Um, and I, I wanna just thank uh, all of the school districts and the private and parochial schools that have been working with us for months now preparing for this reopening uh, with as much safety as possible at our school environment. Great, thank you so much to both of you, Dr. Christina Galley and Dr. Barbara Frere. And thank you for all the pop-up testing sites that you've been doing too. It's really tremendous. I know participation rates are going up, they may vary, but uh, nonetheless, that's great. So thank you. So next we'll recognize in, in the order that they uh, requested uh, Supervisor Hahn, you're on. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And thanks again to Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Galley for uh, your work and for your regular uh, updates to this Board of Supervisors. Uh, it is, uh, there's a little bit of uh, positive uh, news, but overall, uh, you know, our cases are going up, our hospitalizations, as um, uh, Dr. Galley talked about, have nearly doubled in two weeks. And I think it, it, there's a huge sense of frustration with all of us. This is just not where we thought we would be um, uh, in, you know, in August of 2021. We really were thought we were kind of getting on the other side of it and people were starting to make plans to travel again. Uh, and now people are, you know, reconsidering travel plans. Uh, people are reconsidering uh, gathering again at big events. Uh, it's discouraging to lose grounds, particularly as you as you talked about. Um, we have three different vaccine options for people that are safe, effective, prevalent, free. Uh, and I appreciate all the work you've done on on the pop up uh, vaccine clinics. I know there's been a mobile van that I've seen several times in places. I mean, we're taking mobile vans to to churches, to art walks, to sporting events, to pride events. I mean, I think you would I think you would consider driving the mobile van up to somebody's front door if that's what it would take uh, to get them vaccinated. So it does feel like we've really done everything we can to make these vaccines safe, uh, efficient, effective, prevalent, free. Um, but it looks like uh, we may be, as this Board of Supervisors, looking to do to, to correct course on this, um, introduce some, um, you, you know, uh, proposals that would, um, you know, require people to get vaccinated. I know Supervisor Kuhl and I uh, introduced uh, something that we'll be debating later about uh, mandating our county workforce to get uh, vaccinated or tested. And of course, our chair introduced an executive order. Uh, last week that also uh, looks at mandating county employees uh, to be to be vaccinated because as as the as the region's largest employer we do want to send a message um, and I know that there's another motion that we're going to discuss later about should we begin to look at the possibility um, that we require proof of vaccination for people to to enter public spaces so I do think you're going to see this board looking at, okay, what else can we do to correct course um, on what we see as the Delta variant uh, gone wild? Let me just ask you, uh, Dr. Farn, you might have seen the letter. I, I got a letter signed uh, by council members and mayors of, of uh, certain cities that I represent that are, are, are very upset about the mask, indoor mask mandate, although you're kind of talking about how you think that might have um, actually uh, made things a little bit better. And their argument is that they're, they're vaccinated. They've got, like, one of their cities has a 97% uh, vaccination rate for adults over 65, and even they have 92% of their teenagers have been vaccinated in their city. And so they're asking, and I, I'm going to ask you so you can, you can answer their question publicly, you know, they think they've reached herd immunity, and so they don't understand why um, they're being punished uh, by being asked to wear a mask indoors. Is there such thing as herd immunity? Uh, and is herd immunity for the Delta variant too? How high do people's vaccination rates need to get in a particular city to, uh, I don't know, uh, give them uh, a reprieve from wearing masks indoors? Um, so I'm just forwarding their question to you. And I think a lot of people have that question, right? Is there anything... Yeah, of like herd immunity and what does that really mean? Thank you. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I appreciate um, their interest and obviously their concern and, and obviously everybody wants to know, like, you know, what do we have to do so that things do get back to normal? So the first thing I, I want to point out is uh, we, we don't know as much as we wish we knew about the Delta variant. And what we do know right now is not encouraging in terms of its ability to, to be uh, infect so many more people uh, than earlier variants of concern and the more commonly circulating virus we had last year. Um, what I do know is I looked at the data for your for every city in your district and every single city in your district has had a huge increase 
uh, in their case rates between June 15th and July 31st. I mean, every single one with a bunch of your cities, uh, a bunch of cities in, in that district uh, actually having case rates that are over the average case rate uh, for LA County. Um, and this includes, you know, places like Manhattan Beach and the city of Man Hermosa Beaches. So I just want to say, like, it, it, it is sometimes it feels like um, we should, you know, really be doing things very differently. But across the entire county, we've seen explosions in case rates. Um, and the other thing about sort of the masking is the masking right now is, is helping us uh, do a couple of things. Uh, increase vaccination rates because obviously with these explosions in cases and most of it not happening, you know, most of it happening still amongst unvaccinated people uh, in in uh, in many of these cities, there's still a lot of transmission, enough transmission that these rates jumped so much. I mean, we're talking about uh, places uh, like Hermosa Beach going from a case rate of 26 cases per 100,000 on June 15th to 458 cases per 100,000 on July 31st. So these are very big increases, and they indicate that all of us together need to do some more to uh, slow spread right now, and that is the indoor masking requirement. So obviously, um, we have spread, and we have spread across every, pretty much every city uh, across the entire county, and I think the sensible thing to do with that is is to add this this other layer. I mean, you see this happening everywhere uh, in the country and around the world where with the Delta variant uh, and it being so infectious that we're putting in an extra layer of protection that while it may be uh, annoying um, to many, uh, it, it, is, it does not interfere with sort of normal business operations and it allows us to stay in our full reopening. Um, so I would just ask people, you know, the data is not good. It's not good anywhere right now. We've got lots and lots of transmission. Nobody, because you have so much transmission, it's clear nobody, no place is at community, is at community immunity. And with as many people coming in and out of each one of our neighborhoods uh, to work or to play or to visit uh, during the summer, it's really hard to, to just look at one community in and of itself around issues around transmission of a, of a very infectious variant. Thank you uh, for, for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was my question. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll go uh, to Supervisor Holly Mitchell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thanks, as always, to Drs. Ferrer and Galley for your presentations. The slides are always very helpful. I have Two questions, but two follow-ups on the slides for Dr. Ferrer, if I uh, may, Madam Chair. Dr. Ferrer, first of all, on your slide entitled, Where Can We Close the Vaccination Gaps? You said it, and I think I missed it. The uh, blue, green, and pink coloration on the numbers reflect uh, increase in percentage points for vaccinations for those ethnic groups. Do the white numerals reflect no change in uh, vaccination rates? Well, the, the white ones represent either no change or not enough change, <laughs> like not a point increase. So there could have been a little bit of change, but not enough for us to see it move like for Asian residents between the ages of 18 and 29, they're at 71%. And there might have been a little bit of movement, but not enough to go to 80%. Got it. Thank you. The case there actually. So, got it. Um, second clarification question on your sides on the school vaccination event slide. I think it was around slide seventeen. Okay. Um, there, there appears to me, and I tried to enlarge it, and I even have on my glasses, Doctor Ferrer, but those little dots are tiny. <laughs> I just wanted. It, it appears to me that there's a gap in the second district, particularly in South, South LA. And I wanted to hear your perspective about why, particularly because the previous slide that I asked clarification on shows a lower take up among teens of color. 
So when I look at the, that slide, I am looking at communities including Compton, Southgate, Torrance, Linwood, where I see few, if any, vaccination locations. So can we talk about that? Is there a plan to expand? What must we do to improve the vaccination rates of those students of color who live in those communities? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And obviously these are just the ones that are already scheduled supervisors. So we too are working uh, with some of the districts uh, to make sure that there's ample opportunity for students to get vaccinated and trying to make sure that that ample opportunity extends to school campuses. Um, so, so some of this is just reflective of what is already been scheduled. Uh, but we agree with you that wherever there are noticeable gaps, we're working with those school districts um, to see how we can go ahead and close the gap. Uh, and also working with parent groups um, to help us, again, identify places uh, in their communities where their students, uh, where they want their students to go and get vaccinated uh, as well. So, um, you know, we have, we layer upon this, you know, all of the, 400 or so, you know, mobile teams that are out as well, you know, doing a very big effort right now to be able to pick up students. I want to say, and I know you and I talked, you know, we both saw at, at community sites that we were working at this week, and we both saw lots more teams coming in to get vaccinated and felt heartened by that. Uh, but you're right, it's our job to make sure that, again, access is never the barrier to getting anybody vaccinated in LA County. So and, I will have and, my team back to you with more details on what's going on with some of the school districts that you mentioned. Excellent. Thank you. And, and, I, and I was in Compton actually Saturday partnering with Crystal Stairs, uh, a number of other community-based organizations, and was surprised when I talked to the teens about why well, I was glad they were there. Let me start that there. But why it took them so long? And, and literally, we had to sit next to and kind of hold the hands of a couple of the teens who claimed they were just afraid to get the shot. So we have to do whatever we do have, can to, to make sure to get there. Two more quick questions for me. You know, you talk about the countywide test positivity rate at about 5%, but I think that countywide average really masks um, numbers we are seeing in particular, commu in particular communities. I am struck that the test positivity rate at the Martin Luther King Community Hospital campus is double that, almost 10%. Um, given that, and I've asked you about benchmarks in the past as we began to reopen uh, when you instituted the indoor mask requirement, I've asked about benchmarks. So um, are we creating benchmarks that we can apply to inform us when we're gonna need you know, more help, more services in particular areas, either more testing sites, whether we're gonna have to limit again indoor capacity or, or other safety measures or protocols, particularly as we look at this virus continuing to disproportionately impact um, higher risk communities, largely communities of color. So are there benchmarks that you've established that we could look to? I think the, the clearest benchmark right now is the vaccination rate and getting those up because that's okay. the most protection. Um, and that's what we watch, you know, uh, the most carefully. Um, and, and, you know, when those aren't going up fast enough, it is, as you said, then it translates like immediately to higher test positivity because there's more people infected, more people passing on infection, more people getting infected. Um, so I think the primary benchmark for all of us is probably those vaccination numbers. And, and getting those rates up and, and doing everything we can um, to uh, make it easy, build confidence. And at this point in, in some of our higher risk settings, um, you know, go ahead and, and, and move towards mandates uh, because it's just intolerable um, to not make good progress given sort of the dangers that the Delta variant is presenting. You know, we're, we're not plodding along anymore uh, with this virus. This virus, uh, th this variant is, is not a plotter. Uh, this variant, you know, infects uh, many more people uh, at a time. Uh, like one person can infect many more people at a time if they're infected with the Delta variant. And that's all we're seeing is the Delta variant. So 
with this explosion uh, in cases, uh, the best strategy right now uh, from our perspective is to double down on, on getting more and more people vaccinated and, and really do everything we can, including what Supervisor Han said. You know, we will take vaccine to where people are at. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it doesn't take a lot of people for us to go where people are at. We'll go anywhere. That, that was powerful to hear you use the term explosion and how one person with Delta can, can infect many more people than our previous experience. Last question for me, Madam Chair. Going back to your strategies for managing continued high transmission slide, Dr. Ferrer, I noticed a bullet here that says distancing avoids the crowding that facilitates transmission. And so my question to you is regarding outdoor activities. We are in the, the summertime, sporting events are happening, arts and cultural events are happening. Have you, are you considering changing your masking or social distancing guidelines? or requiring vaccine verification for outdoor gatherings, you know, yeah. in mass of large, of significant size? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really important question. And, and thank you, Supervisor, for raising it. Uh, we're obviously talking a lot to Long Beach and Pasadena about this um, because all, you know, all, all of our jurisdictions have what are called these large mega events. They're outside. Before Delta, we thought they were uh, relatively safe for fully vaccinated people. There's always been a problem with transmission for unvaccinated people wherever they are. Uh, we've always recommended, um, but not required, that unvaccinated people in outdoor settings where it's super crowded, they should be keeping their masks on. And as you know, we modified our health officer order um, to require uh, that people are masked up whenever they're like at concession stands or indoors and concourses at sort of the larger stadiums. But we have been talking with our colleagues uh, at Long Beach and at Pasadena about whether or not uh, there, and at the state, whether or not there needs to be uh, a mandate for outdoor masking at these very large mega events. Those are those events that have over 10,000 people where it's almost unavoidable that it's crowded. Uh, and that you're in a crowd, uh, given the largeness of the event. Um, so we will come back to the board. I mean, we were talking also with the state, obviously, about what they're considering. I mean, as I showed you with the data, we're seeing increases, but across the rest of the state, the increases are even bigger in most places uh, in terms of uh, people uh, becoming infected. And whether or not we need to revisit, just as you said, you know, as we learn more and we see the need to uh, continue uh, to try to reduce risk wherever possible while not impeding as much as possible uh, our full reopening, uh, we should consider those strategies. And I think you're absolutely right to point out that outdoor masking when there's uh, a lot of crowded, you know, a lot of people in crowds is a sensible precaution. Uh, we already recommend it everywhere. Um, and, and even at this point, we've said to fully vaccinated people, if you don't know who you're around, and you're outdoors and it's super crowded, you should put on that face covering. But it's not a requirement anywhere at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell. And Supervisor Mitchell, just an FYI, we recently opened a clinic in the city of Bell and we had the city council member from Linwood come and Southgate and a bunch of the neighboring cities. So now they're gonna be able to treat 5,000 people on a weekly basis. and. Thank you to DHS and they're giving out the COVID vaccine. So that's just another good thing. And we got to work together so we can push people out that way. So they don't have to go to travel eight miles down and get a bus and take two hours to get there at their nearest center. So thank you for your questions. Uh, okay, next quickly, we'll go to Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. Um, Thank you. I will go quickly through my concerns as well. Um, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Galley, thank you. As we all have said, for uh, not just your reports, but your work. It has been uh, a year and a half. You and all of our healthcare workers in the county uh, have been exhausted over and over and over again. And we're very grateful to you for continuing this work. Um, I have been alarmed over the past uh, more than a month to see that virtually every week when the new cases are reported by district, my district has the highest number of cases. 
Uh, it's not thought of as being uh, expected because of course, everybody thinks that the third district is mostly white because they don't know it very well. But um, thank you very much for the additional um, help that you're giving us in Venice, in Studio City, and even in Beverly Hills, because uh, the numbers of cases have been quite high and also in West Hollywood and in the Hollywood Hills. Um, if you look at the neighborhoods in the city of LA and you look at the individual cities. So I was trying to understand why that might be if there's a reason. Uh, we don't have a lower vaccination rate, I don't think, but we do have a younger population in some of those areas, in the Hollywood Hills, in West Hollywood, um, in parts of Studio City and certainly in Venice. So I wonder if there has been an attempt to sort of slice and dice uh, as to whether a younger population, which is less vaccinated, is concentrated in these cities and areas that have um, the high overall each week, the highest growth of cases, because it's been quite startling to me. Yeah, I, I mean, we agree. And, you know, obviously we where there are outbreaks, we, we get a fair amount of detail. It's a little bit hard on the contact tracing side just because people have have had so many exposures. But you're, I think you're absolutely right in in what you're noting. Uh, a younger population, that's definitely who's getting infected, uh, more likely to be uh, unvaccinated. But also, you know, uh, there are many folks uh, who are younger who are intermingling just a lot more with people outside of their normal social circle uh, this summer. In, in part, it was because it was the summer of hope at, at one time. And, uh, you know, we, we really uh, uh, had a lot of relaxing that was going on without really fully understanding the risk. Now we fully understand the risk, but there's still a fair amount of what I call sort of social intermingling. Uh, in other communities, many people have been socializing, but with much smaller groups of folks. So they've been socializing with extended family, and that didn't really get expanded much yet. Um, but in places where you have a lot of young people, you know, the bars are full, the restaurants are full. Um, and, you know, people uh, have many more opportunities in those settings in particular, their indoor settings, uh, for there to be multiple exposures and for this to move fairly quickly. Uh, and some of it might also be um, that for folks with resources to enjoy um, some of the newly opened opportunities, um, they can do that more. You know, they can eat out more. They can, you know, go to entertainment venues more because they have more resources. So I think that's a little bit of why you're seeing, you know, these cases are exploding in places where, you know, when we were under much stricter uh, restrictions, uh, there was less transmission because many of these are folks who may not have had to go into work, uh, could do a lot of their work teleworking, and most of the sort of social intermingling opportunities uh, that were indoors were limited, um, if, if not, and some were non-existent. Uh, I think now that things are open, you have a lot more intermingling. And as you noted, those are where we, in that age group is where we have the lower rates of vaccination. So just creates a lot of risk. You know, in the last pandemic that raged through my district, uh, it wasn't my district at the time, uh, the uh, HIV and AIDS pandemic, uh, the bars who also experienced, you know, a lot of people coming to socialize, um, primarily in the LGBTQ community, but not, of course, only, took it upon themselves to do uh, education, to uh, sort of push for people to uh, adopt the protection of the time. And I wonder if we might think about a specific outreach to bars, uh, because I know in San Francisco, they have um, gone together uh, in terms of the restaurant association and agreed that they all want to require proof of vaccination. But, uh, um, it, it would be voluntary at the at the moment, but I wonder if we might do some outreach, and I certainly will, to these particular venues that provide a danger actually to the to a younger population. So that's a rhetorical question. The other part of my question to you today relates to um, the health order uh, about uh, healthcare workers. 
you mentioned EMTs and paramedics to be added to the state order. I totally approve. Dental employees, totally approve. In-home uh, healthcare workers, totally approve. But my question is, are there other categories of county workers who provide pre-hospital <laughs> kinds of services um, that also can put people at risk. I'm thinking of people who do uh, CPR um, or any kind of kind of pre-hospital work that they show up. Is it all EMTs and paramedics that will show up to help? Or for instance, are our sheriff's deputies all trained, uh, you know, the kind of the Red Cross training where they will provide CPR um, and therefore might be called upon to be pre-hospital healthcare workers. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I thought, you know, we know that the sheriff has EMTs and paramedics and, and obviously all EMTs and paramedics are covered. Um, we hadn't uh, really considered this much broader category, um, but uh, we are happy to, to go ahead and have our team look at that and get back to you, Supervisor. Um, what, you know, one of the issues is just finding an entity that folks are employed by that mm -hmm. can do the very, you know, so, I mean, some of it is, you know, as, as you can read through as we're defining everything is, you know, we, we are really relying on sort of these organizations uh, to help us uh, with the implementation, but I'd be happy to, to have our team work with, with your staff and any other board offices to think about who might have been left out and is there a way to, to be more inclusive, focusing, of course, on, on healthcare services. Right, because the intersection of the uh, low vaccine rate, um, it, it, to me, it's astounding that there's a lower percentage in the sheriff's department and in the fire department uh, are, and in probation than in other areas. Um, and I have uh, gotten very troubling uh, news about several of the uh, employees in the sheriff's department and supervisors who are buying this sort of Fox News disinformation about uh, vaccines being made from the cells of dead babies. And a couple of them have said they would rather be fired than to be stuck with, uh, you know, the cells of dead babies. And I, of course, would love to accommodate them and fire them tomorrow. But, um, you know, be careful what you ask for. But I um, am worried about the intersection of those who are refusing vaccination, especially in these yeah. departments, and maybe providing pre-hospital health care uh, that are who are not EMTs and paramedics. So I'd really very much uh, appreciate it because just as a closing remark, people talking about the freedom and uh, you know people who don't know what the hell they're talking about talking about unconstitutionality. I'd love to sick my con law professor on them. Um, I remember my dad said that your ability to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. And that's exactly the problem that we're facing with the selfishness of people who are not getting vaccinated. Those who cannot, okay, a medical exemption, fine. But those who can and won't, this is not just about them. And I think it's it's really necessary, and we'll have this conversation when we talk about our own employees next, but that people understand their impact, not just on themselves and their families, not just on the people around them, but these exhausted healthcare workers who started a year and a half ago and are now being put through it again. Um, one of our own directors went to the emergency room because he had a scare and said there are white tents up again with, with cots like there were during the surge, that the hospitals are really facing a problem that is so far not being seen as much as it was during the surge. So thank you for all the work that you put in. I'd be interested to know if there are other healthcare workers we should be looking at. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for your support, Supervisor. Thank you very much for uh, your line of questioning, Supervisor Kuehl. Um, Supervisor Barger, did you want to weigh sure. in? Yeah, I, just really quickly, and because I know, Supervisor Kuehl, you mentioned about um, public safety, um, law enforcement and fire having low 
vaccination rates. And my, I was told, and I was trying to get that number because I'm not getting a straight answer. I was actually told that fire did not, um, it was not inputted correctly. So it's the number that we were provided originally is not accurate, that in fact, more have been vaccinated. And then I hear Fesia say that two thirds of the workforce for LA County are vaccinated. And I think it would be helpful for us as a board to understand the right number um, because I'm I'm a little confused, and I don't know, if Dr. Fur, if you have it, or if someone is tracking this, um, so that we can get a handle to Sparza Kill's point, so that we can really focus on what departments and see how we can do better outreach or and or education or even look at the age group, because maybe it is the younger age that are are uh, vaccine resistant, so that we can kind of put something together. I, I completely agree. I, I don't, we don't have the numbers at the health department, but maybe Fesia could talk more about the, the numbers by county departments because we don't, we don't keep that information at the health department. But, but we do need to- Yes, morning, morning, thank you. Supervisors. Um, supervisors, the information that I shared previously was information that we received from Kaiser uh, you may know that Kaiser is our largest health plan and they enroll uh, a majority of our employees. And what they have shared with us is that about 60%, roughly about 60% of um, our county employee, our county employees with Kaiser have been vaccinated. And so what we did is we extrapolated uh, from that figure. That's how we came down to the 60-30 number. Uh, to extrapolate it countywide. We are working with them, however, um, as we're preparing for the vaccination mandate to actually get more specific numbers uh, from all of our health plans and not just for Kaiser. Okay, so the two thirds is a, a, a guesstimate, if you will, based on Kaiser and then kind of giving a margin of error e e either way, right? So, yeah, so the two thirds is the number that we got specifically for Kaiser employees. Right. Right. And then what we did is we extrapolated it to get the number countywide. Got it. Um, and Supervisor, then, um, go ahead. Supervisor, I know from, um, for, from Chief Osby that for fire, uh, he said it's like 70%. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Furrer. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask these questions and I'm going to let you answer them. Um, can you talk about, I, I'm, I'm seeing on the news, people are now getting a third shot, even though it's not recommended. And so I, I'd like to understand, um, the, the are there issues with that in terms of, of public health safety? Because I don't even know if it's been tested. So the, um, the side effects of that um, and how are we deciphering who is getting that third shot? Or are they using fictitious names? Because I'm assuming if you come in and you've seen that you've been fully vaccinated, you're not going to authorize a third shot. So that's my number one question. And then number two, have we seen the Lamba variant in L.A. County yet or even in the state of California? Because I'm hearing about the Lamba um, variant that is now out there. And I was just curious to know if that's something that, that um, we're seeing any of. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then I'll let you answer that, Dr. Furrer. Okay, thanks. Um, so, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, the FDA has not authorized the third shot of, of any of these vaccines or a second shot of Johnson & Johnson. Uh, so it would not be an approved use, and it's nothing that would be happening at any of our sites. But you're also right to note um, that it, it's um, if people want to be very devious and come and get a third shot, uh, there are lots of different ways for them to do that. Um, most uh, most sites, um, particularly the like the pop up sites, uh, if somebody comes in and says they've never been vaccinated, um, and they give um, you know a different address or something slightly different about their profile, uh, it would be hard for us in that moment to actually figure out that they've already gotten their two doses. I mean, there is a system of registration system uh, that can help with that. 
But usually, you know, this sort of matching, you know, algorithm is done later on behind the scenes, and it's usually done to try to get people in for their second doses, um, not as sort of a barrier to getting vaccinated, especially right now where we're like trying to vaccinate everybody and reduce, you know, the requirements to get vaccinated. So there's almost nowhere where as an adult, you'd have to really show proof anymore of, of who you are. For children, we need a proof of their age, but not for anybody else. So I would just say, you know, if, if somebody wanted to be really devious and, and was desperate to get that third shot or a second shot of Johnson & Johnson or do a mix and match, you know, I got Johnson & Johnson, now I want to come in and get Pfizer. None of that is approved. None of that would happen if that's what people tell us. And people do tell us. And some people do come in and say, yeah, I'm here. I want a third shot. And here is why. Or my doctor told me I should get a third shot. Uh, but we don't administer those. Uh, and we just tell people the FDA is reviewing. I believe it's next week. Uh, the ICS panel is reviewing. I believe it's next week. One is on the 13th. I think one's on the 14th. The entire sort of uh, literature and uh, evidence around the efficacy or the need for boosters. And we're going to need to wait until they go ahead. And since they're the ones who decide how you can use these, uh, these medicines, this vaccine, then we need to wait for instructions from them before we would go ahead and, and authorize any uh, third, third uh, vaccine doses uh, for Moderna or Pfizer or second vaccine dose for Johnson & Johnson. Thank you. And then on the Lamba, have we seen any of that? Um, I, I will have a report, um, uh, you know, I get it tomorrow, actually, Supervisor, so I'll, I'll double check. Um, I think there have been some lambda identified, but I don't think it's a significant uh, number. But let me get you exact information on, on that and, and what we actually have found. And what I really don't know is was that for California or just for L.A. County. So uh, let me get back to you with that information. Thank you, Dr. Fern. Thank you, um, Dr. Daly, as well, um, for your leadership. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for, thank you for all your support. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. And um, I just had a quick question, uh, Dr. Ferrer, just dawned on me that, you know, when we have disasters or things happen where maybe there's a fire and we usually call upon um, the Red Cross to meet us there, whether it's dealing with homeless or evacuations and things of that nature, um, where are we with those uh, types of organizations? Because they provide a, a health uh, aspect to what they do. They do CPR, but they also interact with a lot of people. And I'm just wondering, um, is that something that, that you all have thought about? Because they work in tandem with our fire department and sometimes with our sheriffs and public safety at, at, uh, across the county. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, we really, you know, mimic in many ways uh, the state's definition of sort of healthcare workers, you know, looking at their July 26th um, order, which was the first order on, you know, who, who was being defined as a healthcare worker. We noted, you know, a couple of places where nobody was explicitly listed uh, and included those, but uh, we, we didn't expand it further than that. And again, Supervisor Solis, we're happy to look at additional groups and we're also happy to reach out like to the Red Cross and see whether they're, uh, as an organization, going to go ahead and mandate uh, vaccinations for their employees. Because some of some of this, and I think Supervisor Kuhl noted this as well, like you have dozens and dozens of bars that are, in fact, I mean, they're not going to wait. They've already decided they want an extra layer of protection. They're not letting people in who aren't fully vaccinated. So there are many places where people are just moving forward. Uh, you know, given given the need for additional safety. Um, but we'll check and we'll get back to you on that as well. Great. Okay. Supervisor, could you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I had two questions I meant to ask, and I it was on the second page. Um, first of all, do you know the progress made about in um, testing uh, for children younger than 12, and if we might expect uh, conditional approval? So what I what I know about that is that Pfizer has was Pfizer and Moderna were told to to do a little bit more work, um, and uh, in, with their studies, 
uh, with their clinical trials for younger kids. Uh, Pfizer has indicated they will be submitting their application in September. I think uh, with an aggressive timeline, uh, that means, uh, you know, maybe an approval uh, by December. I know there's a lot of push. I know the Academy of Pediatrics has, has really asked the FDA to move and expedite, you know, given the urgency and the emergency of, uh, of having so much transmission. Uh, but I, I don't know, I mean, you can't expedite and drop safety um, and safety requirements. So I think that that, that realistic timeline that we've been given uh, is probably how long it might take uh, to make sure, again, that uh, everybody is, is looking at all of the information uh, on those scientific advisory boards uh, with ample opportunity to get what they need from the company uh, before they go ahead uh, with an approval. Well, speaking of that, I, there are a number of people who have said, and I think it's bogus, of course, myself, that they would like to wait for final FDA approval on these original vaccines. Um, yeah. As though millions and millions and millions and millions of people getting them, you know, didn't convince them. But uh, is there any information about that final approval uh, timeline? Yeah, I think we're hearing that that should come in early September. Again, you know, there's not, you know, it's not like uh, the FDA has made an announcement saying that's when it's going to be. Dr. Fauci has indicated that that's when it ought to be. Uh, but again, you know, there I do think, um, you know, they've been looking at information for a very long time now because these were approved, you know, nine more than almost a year ago right. uh, for emergency use authorization. So, you know, there's been a lot more time to really do those assessments. Uh, and, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, we will have full approval uh, from the FDA by early September. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, so I want to also thank you, Dr. Ferrer, Dr. Galley, and to all our CBOs and our stakeholders that have really helped us push out in the last couple of weeks more vaccinations. So a big applause to all of them and to you for your help. So uh, members on this item, this is uh, simply a receive and file. So hearing no objection, that will be the order. Thank you. Okay, members, we're gonna move on now to item 73A. And uh, that is the ratification of the August 4th 2021 executive order and directive to the CEO regarding establishment of a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy for county employees, which I held. So I will go ahead and begin. <clears throat> Colleagues, I, I wanna speak to you today, not just as chair of the board of supervisors, but also as a county resident myself. Um, and as you know, it, it's well noted that 18 months since our first uh, confirmed cases appeared in the county uh, and on to January 26, 2020, it has been an exhausting 18 months for I think all of us here in Los Angeles County. In that year and a half alone, we've seen more than 1.3 million residents test positive for COVID and we lost well over 25,000 residents, leaving behind many of their friends or family members who will dearly miss them. And on top of all that, we've seen our businesses modify their practices to keep customers safe, and some close their businesses altogether, and some may never open up again. But this year, with the hope of the three vaccines, I, like many, saw hope. We saw as residents weary from the lockdown showed up in the hundreds of thousands in the past few weeks, eagerly rolling up their sleeves to get a shot. Our nurses, our doctors, our teachers, our grocery workers, our essential employees and nursing home workers, retirees, and even students, when they were eligible, so many came forward to get those shots. To them and to those who got vaccinated, I especially want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You not only saved lives, but you also likely saved lives of other people from getting sick. But those who remain unvaccinated are vulnerable. And as we have seen, the highly transmissible Delta variant was all too willing to take advantage. Now we're regularly seeing daily cases upwards of 3,000 and even 4,000, driven largely by those unvaccinated and a far cry from the low 200s we saw just in mid-June. We have found ourselves in the midst of a terrible surge once again, the fourth in our county. 
Unlike the previous three surges, however, we have highly effective tools available to us to shut down the spread with these three vaccines. And although 72% of our county residents receiving one dose and over 2.2 million residents still have not been vaccinated. And that's not even considering the over 1 million residents under the age of 12 that are not yet eligible and will soon be, soon be returning to their classrooms as we know, and some have already begun. We must, in my opinion, take meaningful actions to protect them. The public health experts across the country have said time and time again, the best way to protect your kids is to get vaccinated yourself. And we heard that again today, resoundingly. I can't stress enough the time to get vaccinated is right now. And it's never been that easier. We've had education efforts. We've had extensive mobile units going directly to where people are, including their homes, churches, swamp meets, parks, museums, libraries. We even set up hundreds of pop-up sites across the county. And we, had, we have done our job in helping to educate and provide incentives, monetary incentives and others. And yet mil millions of people are still hesitant and have refused to do their part altogether. There are of course many reasons for that. Some of it is confusion, some of it's fear, some of it's misinformation, and some are ideologically opposed. But over the last eight months of the vaccine administration, I don't think we can wait any longer. Many of the 24,000 residents who have lost their lives didn't have an opportunity in some ways to get vaccinated. I will forever be haunted by those lives lost who never had that opportunity or could even say goodbye to their loved ones. As a chair of the Board of Supervisors, each life loss weighs heavily on me and I know on some of you, especially if there is more we can do to save lives. And as I have seen cases increase dramatically, largely preventable, hospitalizations have increased and sadly deaths slowly rising, inaction, in my opinion, is no longer an option. And that is why last week I exercised my authority as chair of the board and issued an executive order requiring, requiring all county employees to be fully vaccinated by October the 1st. Here in the county, we have over 110,000 employees. And as the board of supervisors, we must do everything to safeguard the health of our workforce who are at the heart and soul of everything we do. But in addition to that, our employees provide essential services to some of the most vulnerable residents in our county. By getting vaccinated, our employees not only protect their own lives and that of their families and coworkers, but also significantly reduce the risk of transmission to residents that we serve. And as a county and as a board, our pandemic response has been and must continue to be characterized by bold, proactive leadership to keep our 10 million residents safe. We should show our leadership. Issuing, and we did, we issued a masking requirement in public indoor spaces. We were the first to do that, if not in the country, despite significant pushback, but we saw that it was the right thing to do. And with our leadership, we've seen even the CDC and the state of California and other localities across the country follow our example and have implemented and recommended masking guidance emulating ours in varying degrees. Now, I believe we must be prepared to lead once again. By requiring vaccinations for our county employees, we are setting an example for employers across our county and to others across the country who watch what we do. With this motion, we can develop and implement a safe and effective path forward in consultation, obviously, with all of our labor partners to help keep our county safe. And with an October 1st deadline, we give our employees ample time to meet and confer with their health providers to answer any questions that they might have. Colleagues, this is simply the right thing to do. It is the most effective action. It will save lives, will make businesses safer, and will finally help us put this terrible pandemic behind us once and for all. And it is not unprecedented. We have already seen some private entities that are large in size as well, like Microsoft, Facebook, Kaiser Permanente, and the United Airlines step forward and do this. And even yesterday, the Pentagon announced that they will be requiring the COVID vaccines for all troops by September the 15th. The state of Washington followed suit with the vaccine mandate for all our state employees as well. And I'm pleased that one of my friends and former colleagues, Governor 
Jay Ensley's staff and ours have been in touch on this issue. Colleagues, I want to respectfully and humbly ask for your I vote. Before I, I uh, turn it over to members who want to who want to speak, I would like to ask a few questions of our county council and the CEO, Public Health and Department of Health Services. And my first question goes to our county council. As you know, this process was set in motion by the executive order I issued on August 4th as chair of the board. And it has come to my attention, many people are not aware of what authority I might have as chair. Can you please explain that authority that is provided uh, and, and how it is issued, especially in an emergency order to initiate a COVID-19 vaccination policy for county employees? That's my first question for county council. Thank you for your question. Without waiving the attorney client privilege to share with the board, what I'm comfortable saying is that under the California Emergency Services Act, during a proclaimed emergency, the board may issue orders or regulations necessary to provide for the protection of life and property. In the Los Angeles County Code, the board delegates this authority in the first instance to the chair. In order for an emergency order issued by the chair to remain in effect, it must be ratified at the next regular meeting of the board. Thank you. Thank you. And we have, this isn't the first time that we have actually uh, approved executive orders, correct? That is correct. We've issued other executive orders in the past, uh, one example being the eviction moratorium. Correct. And this is all based on the uh, COVID pandemic. Is that, is that correct? Correct. All of these emergency orders or executive orders were issued during this proclaimed emergency. Thank you, County Council. Next, I'd like to ask Asia Davenport if she could please uh, outline her plan to engage our labor partners and to ensure an effective implementation process that is inclusive. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, we know and understand that in implementing uh, this process that we're gonna have to work with labor we have in the CEO's office engaged our full employee relations team. Uh, they have already started reaching out to labor and we stand at the ready to partner with them on this very important uh, process. Uh, with regard to uh, implementation, we of course will uh, report back to your board with the details of our, of our implementation plan. Uh, and we have established basically a multidisciplinary team uh, comprised of county council, human resources, uh, departmental administrators uh, to help us work out the details of what would be included in the plan. Thank you. My next question is for Dr. Barbara Ferrer. Could you please discuss the benefits of having a vaccine requirement for county employees? And do you believe that this is the most efficient path forward? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Solis. And as I noted earlier, um, the fastest way for us to be able to slow transmission is through vaccinations. It's the most powerful tool because it's the most effective tool and it's taking us uh, a very long time to get enough people vaccinated to really reap the benefits that these vac vaccines offer. Given the sort of at this point, uh, ample history and evidence of safety and efficacy uh, we do support uh, a mandate that would uh, allow everybody to come in as quickly as possible to get vaccinated. Of course, offering uh, uh, medical exemptions and uh, religious exemptions as required by law. Dr. Uh, Ferrer, just to follow up, can you explain uh, mandates of other types of vaccines that are on the books? Well, you know, I mean, everybody is familiar. I mean, many children in order to go to school are required to be vaccinated. Uh, for many healthcare workers, for example, they're also required um, to get vaccinated for influenza uh, as well, depending on what where you're working and what your population is, you may have other requirements uh, for different vaccines. We have requirements that people uh, who are working in some of our place, in some clinics uh, need to, in fact, uh, get regular TB testing. So I think uh, in many places, there's lots of experience with 
there being requirements, uh, and they're there to ensure everybody's safety. Uh, you know, really, in, in, in this case, uh, primarily the workforce safety. Correct, thank you. Uh, my last question is for Dr. Christina Galley. Can you speak to how requiring all our county's healthcare workers to be vaccinated would impact the patient experience? Yes, thank you for that question. Supervisor, I, I'm appreciative of your efforts on this and that of the entire board. Uh, hospitals and health systems, including in DHS, should be places of health and healing where patients are protected. And they come to our sites in DHS, as well as to a variety of other places in the county with confidence that they're going to receive high quality services that enhance their health, protect their health, and doesn't put their health at risk. And part of being able to provide them with that confidence to our patients and helping to improve their overall experience is having a staff that is fully vaccinated. Staff that won't present a risk to themselves as patients or to other staff and colleagues or to the family and friends of staff, whether it's immunocompromised family members or children who either aren't able to be vaccinated or can't mount a response to vaccination. And as you've mentioned, many private healthcare systems have already taken this important step, including Kaiser, Sutter, and others. Already over 1,500 hospitals in the United States, which is over a quarter of all of the hospitals in the country, have now mandated the COVID vaccine. And I do believe that because of our unique role as the safety net, the vulnerable population that we serve, and our role as the public sector entity that re relies on taxpayer funds to deliver the services that we do to the public, we have this responsibility to provide the best service possible to our patients and the general public. The best way to do that is through a vaccine. Thank you, uh, Dr. Galley, and thank all of you for your questions. And uh, again, members, I respectfully request your I vote and support on the matter. I'd like to now turn to my colleagues that have requested to speak on this item. So I'll recognize first Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate your leadership during these very trying times. And I'd like to thank my board colleagues, uh, the CEO and departments for trying to sort through the constantly shifting rules, frankly, about who gets vaccines, who's exempted, who must get tested, who must show proof and what type of proof is accepted. I am clear that this isn't easy and it's absolutely confusing. And I agree fundamentally that it's time to do more, that we must continue as a board to lead by example. I also think it's important that we are very, very clear, crystal clear. We can't afford to create confusion among our hardworking and dedicated county employees. That's why I think it's really important that we're clear about the approval of the two items that are before us today. This motion, Madam Chair, 73A, and item 21 that will follow. It means that we are requiring, and I wanna be clear, that the passage of both means that we are requiring all county employees to show full vaccination by October 1, unless they fall under a legitimate exemption. While it may be tempting to provide more flexibility for people not to be vaccinated and, and get tested instead, this would just delay the inevitable at significant human and financial costs to the county. The financial and logistical costs, as well as the human lives that could be lost by allowing people to opt out of vaccines and getting tested instead is immense. I uh, listened to public comment today. I have reviewed the public comment that's coming to my office. And I have to just make a couple of comments. I don't believe the Nuremberg, Nuremberg Code is relevant in this situation. I don't believe that the vaccine can be compared to human experimenta experimentation. I am not a pawn of big pharma. I don't believe that imposing vaccines for county workers who are uh, perform outward facing work to the residents of the county 
should be considered immoral. I am sorry that some of our county employees um, feel that we are not taking their best interests at heart. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I, we are being challenged to quote, follow the science and based on the public comments made today by the chief medical officers of LA County USC, all of you, the texts I've received from the CEO of MLK Community Hospital, um, who mandated that her staff all be vaccinated, and so many of the other comments we received, I believe we are indeed following the science. Um, communications that suggest that SARS-CoV-2 does not exist and that it's a fraud, well, there are hundreds of thousands of people nationwide and far too many people who call LA County home and the second supervisorial district home who would question that assertion. This is far from a fraud. We are living and attempting to govern and lead through a public health pandemic of a magnitude I could have never imagined. That's why I'll be supporting this action today. I support the ratification of the executive order to mandate vaccines for all employees of LA County and hope that many of our private and public partners will follow um, because I fundamentally believe it is the only option available to us to do all that we can to keep residents of LA County safe from harm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Janice Hahn, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, while I agree with everything we're saying, uh, before I vote to ratify this executive order, I had a question uh, for our county executive officer, Fusia Davenport. And the question is, um, so Supervisor Kuhl and I have a motion that also says uh, county workers are mandated to get uh vaccinated or have regular testing and the and also that um, we look at the possibility of requiring our contractors and our vendors who do business with the county and who interact with the public uh, get vaccinated. This executive order does not address testing even for those who would have a medical or religious, um, reason to be exempted. Um, clearly, I, I believe we all have the, the common goal of, you know, getting as many people as we can vaccinated um, in the county, in our county em em employee group, and to keep our workplace safe because we're going to start bringing people back. So my my question is, Fizia, how do we reconcile uh, the executive order with Supervisor Kuhl's and my motion, which is coming up to be discussed. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for the question, and thank you, Board of Supervisors. Um, we see this at the CEO's office as a two-step process. Um, the first part of the process is the what, and the what really speaks to what is the board requiring of county employees. And we believe that that question is answered by the executive order. The board is requiring that county staff be vaccinated by October 1st. Then there is a second part of this process, which is the how. How will we actually implement that? And how will we actually ensure compliance? What does it actually look like? And I believe that the how component supervisor is answered by your motion which directs the CEO's office to come back with a policy uh, within 15 days. We understand that this is a complex and a difficult issue. Uh, we have already put together a multidisciplinary team, as I mentioned earlier, including county council and human resources and the, the managers, the human resources managers for departments. And so we know that any implementation uh, policy will have to include a process to be able to identify 
employees that have been vaccinated and employees that have not been vaccinated. That was one of the questions that uh, was asked earlier during the set item. We know that we are going to have to make some exceptions that uh, that may be required by law. Um, and then the question becomes, well, what do we do with that with that group of staff? We know that there will be employees uh, who simply do not want to be uh, vaccinated. And so the question becomes, what are the options for those for those employees? Because this work is dynamic and it's ongoing, we have not figured it out yet. Uh, we are it's still a work in progress. But we want to figure out a way to honor the mandate. We understand that there may be some role for testing uh, as as uh, stated in your motion, but we don't know exactly what that role is going to be. We don't think that it's it's uh, at least in a CEO's office uh, fiscally feasible to have unlimited testing. And so the question is, you know, what role does testing play? How limited is it? Under what circumstances might that might that apply? And under what specific circumstances? But at the end of the day. The overall goal is to reach the policy mandate, but we understand that oftentimes the details, the implementation details uh, requires um, uh, certain actions that may not necessarily be called out in, in the motions. And so we need to return to your board with a comprehensive uh, plan to uh, make sure that we are implementing the board's vision by having this mandatory uh, vaccination requirement and then work out all of the logistical details that are required to implement such a, a program countywide. Okay, I th thank you for that. Um, and again, um, uh, you're right. I think our overall goal is to get uh, county employees vaccinated. Uh, I do believe that even for those who have a religious or medical reason to be exempted, I do believe they need to get tested because still, otherwise, you know, they're not vaccinated and they're still in our workplace. And I really uh, believe that when we begin to bring county employees back, they need to feel safe um, that, you know, they're sitting next to somebody in a cubicle and that, that they've either, either uh, you know, have a, a negative test or they've been vaccinated. I think that's fair uh, for uh, county employees coming back. And I also um, hope that I that we have support for Supervisor Kuehl's and my motion in, in terms of exploring the possibility of looking at um, our contractors and our vendors, if we can also bring them under the umbrella of being vaccinated. So you're basically saying, Executive order is the what, which is we want everybody vaccinated. Supervisor Kuehl's and my motion is how are we actually going to do this? And that would include looking at the possibility of testing. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said, sort of? Yes, that is correct, Supervisor. And I didn't speak to the contractor issue, but we will also include, uh, we will also address that in our policy. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Fizia, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Hahn, also, for your indulgence. Supervisor Kuehl, you're recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, too, strongly support uh, the ratification of your executive order and the requirement of vaccination for every county employee. Um, you know, it's interesting, the whole job of a county employee, I don't care which of the 37 departments they serve in, is essentially serving the public. And since the basic job of the county has been not just serving the public, but serving the most vulnerable, the most needy, the most unable to care for themselves part of the public, they are also the most vulnerable to this pandemic. And that means that we must be extra responsible about our county employees who come in contact every day with uh, all of these vulnerable people. They are putting recovery at risk if they're not vaccinated. They are putting the public at risk if they're not vaccinated, certainly their coworkers. And um, it's possible that we may need to do some town halls like we do for our constituents, for our employees, 
just to really educate them about any fears that they might have. And we might, one of the things that FISIA might look at in the report back is the question of education, not just requirements and, you know, elements. Um, I know that we must meet and confer because although we can put a policy in place immediately, which I approve, um, the how of it, as we've talked about, relates to impacts on our workers and that has a requirement of meet and confer. And I think that must start right away because we don't that want that to slow down the impact. Uh, I think one of the questions about our motion, Supervisor Hans, uh, which I'm uh, very pleased to co-author, um, was what does it mean now and what does it mean after October 1st? Uh, I would simply posit to the CEO in the report back, my preference would be that we might start immediately learning who is vaccinated and who is not, allowing people to test if they are not vaccinated through the next eight or nine weeks until the beginning of October. But that after the deadline in October, I would feel most comfortable only allowing testing for those who have a valid exemption not just, oh, I don't wanna do it. Because testing's not, it's free to people, but it's not free to the county. And if you're talking a third of the county that may not be, vac county workers that may not be vaccinated, that is an enormous amount of not only testing, but checking and personnel and all of the accoutrement that we would need to do it. So the tighter, the better after October 1st, I think. But the reason that Janice's motion is so important is uh, really kind of two things. One is asking Fiji to come back and tell us, how do we do this? Including, I think, the question of meet and confer. The question of our contractors, because they're coming in contact with the public on our behalf. And therefore, we're making the public and we're putting them in danger if we don't require it. But we want to know, can we do that? So I strongly support the ratification of your executive order. Of course, I strongly support our motion and see them as being harmonized, uh, which I tried to explain to KNX yesterday and hope I did a fairly decent job. <laughs> 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 Difficult as it is, because I see them as harmonizable. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Uh, I think this is a major big step and one that we must take. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Supervisor Kuhl. Next, I'll recognize Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And actually, um, Supervisor Mitchell touched on what I was going to um, mention, and that is the issue of clarity and consistency. And I, and Supervisor Kuhl, I appreciate that the motions being working in harmony. I think that having labor involved is vital for the clarity and the consistency to their members, and because they are our labor partners and they represent a majority of our workforce. And, um, and I'm pleased that um, we are beginning to talk, and I think some are already dis in discussions, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Thesia, in terms of reaching out to um, begin discussions um, uh, on this issue. Are, have you been talking to any of the labor partners? Thank you, Supervisor. We have, in fact, already started uh, discussions uh, with our labor partners, and we have actually already established uh, schedules for when conversations will occur uh, with our, our various uh, bargaining units. Thank you. And, and I think it's important that when we roll this out, we do recognize the religious and medical exclusion. And the devil is going to be in the details as it relates to the testing component. I think that, you know, I'm a little confused over whether once a week is sufficient and or twice a week. I don't know. And that's where we're going to have to really um, depend upon our uh, our public health um, to help guide us in that direction. But I think that um, this is a good step in the right direction. And we are we are talking it, but we're now walking it. And I think it's important for us as a county when we're pushing out um, the need to get vaccinated, um, we are doing it in our own home. And I think that speaks volumes to our commitment to not only our county family, but also to the entire LA County um, uh, residents 
that we represent. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Barger, and to all the members and our staff, our CEO, County Council, and all of our 110,000 employees that we represent and contractors as well. As, as was mentioned before, uh, this executive order is the what? The next item that we will hear will be the how. And I think there is a uh, harmony here. So again, I would re respectfully request your I vote. So seeing no other comments uh, on behalf of other board members, item 73A is before us. I will move the item seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 73A is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you so much, members, and to all the folks that called in earlier today as well and submitted their uh, emails and letters of support. Uh, next, members, we're going to turn now to item number 21, and this is uh, the COVID-19 vaccine for Los Angeles County employees, which was held by Supervisor Janice Hahn. Supervisor Hahn, please unmute your mic and begin. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, this is the how, uh, as was so uh, uh, graciously explained by our CEO. So it's clear that I, I think we're all on the same page that we've hit a wall when it comes to uh, getting more people vaccinated. Uh, we're, uh, again, providing vaccines at sporting events, grocery stores, public spaces, um, our, health, our public health care workers, as well as some of our uh, supervisors are going door to door, uh, trying to get people vaccinated. Uh, but still, uh, 30 to 40 percent of people are not vaccinated, or some of them aren't even going back to get their second dose. And we know that that's a problem. But I, I believe we're all on the same page that we need to lean in uh, when it comes to our county workforce. And we want to make sure that our county workforce is protected and the public that they serve is protected. Uh, it's estimated that about 35% of our county workers are not vaccinated. But I think, it's, as Catherine said, we want to make sure we've got the right numbers there. Um, and that's why uh, a, a week and a half ago, uh, Supervisor Kuhl and I introduced a motion uh, to require all of our county workers to get vaccinated or get tested and for us to look at including county contractors as well. And I wanted to underscore, which I think we've also talked about today in, in many conversations, that it's important uh, that we work with our labor partners on this. We want to bring everyone along together. Um, I know I have heard over the weekend from some of our labor partners who were concerned going forward on how this was actually going to work. Um, and um, I, I want to make sure that we bring them uh, uh, along. Now, I just want to let you know that in this uh, motion, uh, I've removed with Supervisor Kuhl's approval, I think, uh, the third directive, which talks about healthcare workers, uh, you know, adding COVID-19 to the list of vaccines that our healthcare workers have to get before they work in the healthcare industry. I removed that because uh, the, the state has mandated that. So there was no need for us to put that into our uh, motion. And then since it mentioned the fire department, I've just, we're now going to treat the fire department as part of our uh, larger a county employee pool, and they'll be treated um, like everyone else. Um, according to this motion, it would be get vaccinated or get tested, but we're going to work out the details on that. And I, I think um, this how is going to be really the nitty gritty, like how are we really going to do this? How, are, how will testing work? Um, how will those medical and religious exemptions work? Um, and I appreciate, uh, Fizia, all the work that you're doing, and your staff is going to be working overtime in figuring this out. And I do know that, as Supervisor Kiel, you brought up, you know, testing is, is, is not cheap. Uh, it's not free. I do, uh, I'm a little uh, concerned with our, some of our health care provide our insurance providers, and I wouldn't mind us 
uh, as a board, uh, putting a little more pressure on them to cover testing. Uh, it seems to be uh, unfortunate that they've immediately sort of said, well, that's not covered under this plans. It reminds me, uh, Supervisor Solis, of uh, when you all were working on the Affordable Care Act, right? I mean, that's why that law exists, because insurance companies were trying to put their own feelings on what was and what wasn't uh, covered. This is clearly a health issue to be tested. It's clearly a workplace safety issue to be tested. So let's maybe figure that out as a sub uh, section of what we're doing here today to figure out a way, um, maybe a, a five signature letter or something that we push back a little bit because I think testing is, is, is key uh, to knowing whether or not someone is safe uh, to come back to work. So thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Appreciate uh, you, you working with me uh, on this one. Um, I think this is important that we move this forward as well um, as we just ratified the executive order so that the whole package is well thought out and important. Overall goal, I know, I believe it, we've got to get our county employees uh, vaccinated. We're going to send a huge uh, message as the largest employer in the region that we we are serious about this and um, I, I'm, uh, I, I hope that I can get your support on, on this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Q, would you like to be recognized as a co-author? Uh, yes, I only have to say this. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Um, are any other Board members wanting to speak on this yeah, item? If we, were, if we were in a court of law, Ms. Kuhl, the, the, uh, the judge would say, can you please be verbal in case some people can't see the screen? I did <laughs> say vote yes at the end before I mute it again. <laughs> okay. okay, very, see very good. Time. <laughs> very good. Seeing no other uh, requests to speak uh, than this item. Uh, 21 is as revised as before us, moved by Supervisor on and Supervisor Q to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Sorry about that. Item 21 as revised is before you. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Q. Aye. Supervisor Q, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Great. Thank you, members. Now we'll move on to item number 73B, which is the evaluation of COVID-19 vaccine requirements for indoor public spaces, which was held by Supervisor Janice Hahn. Supervisor Hahn, please unmute your mic and begin your... Thanks, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Again, I, I feel like we're at, at a place now that we need to look at actions to correct course. I, I think all of us have been extremely frustrated and disappointed at what we're seeing as a new surge. And as we're entering the winter and fall, uh, fall and winter, uh, we, we've heard that things could go in the wrong direction. The fact that we're seeing 3,000 new cases per day is just unbelievable to us. And so I think to prevent for future surges and new variants from circulating, uh, especially um, as we approach uh, this season, we, I think, need to take a good hard look at whether or not we need to um, put into place additional measures um, like uh, requiring proof of vaccination in, for certain settings. And I think it's time uh, that we explore the possibility of requiring people to show proof of vaccination uh, for certain indoor spaces. So this motion before us doesn't do anything today. I, I know my email box has gotten overrun with people crying tyranny and uh, calling me all sorts of names, but today is not a, a, an action that anything uh, it begins to happen besides asking our public health department, our lawyers, and really importantly, our Department of uh, Consumer and Business Affairs to report back to us, uh, advise us as county supervisors on what our options are if we decide to look at uh, 
proof of vaccination in certain spaces. Uh, some of the questions that I have that I would like to see back in this report, should this apply to all public spaces or maybe we look at just non-essential uh, businesses to require proof of vaccination. In other words, should we just make sure that grocery stores are always accessible to anyone, no matter uh, whether or not they're vaccinated, as long as they wear a mask? Um, should we look at the idea of proof of vaccination for one dose, or we want to look at, no, it's going to be two doses, or you, know, you can't enter this uh, facility? Should we look, of course, at children 12 and under who write at now, right now can't be vaccinated, what happens to them if we did an indoor uh, vaccination uh, requirement? And how would this be enforced? Would we leave that up to the individual businesses to stand at the door and check uh, proof of vaccination or, or what? And then um, how does the average person know how do they verify their vaccination? Is it that white card? Um, is it a digital record? Is it a QR code? Um, Healthvana, I know, um, it, it has circulated emails to people saying, uh, "We, you know, this already exists. This digital uh, proof already exists. All you have to do is sign up for it." So um, I want to understand how an average person verifies their vaccination, and how does the business know whether it, uh, a person is telling the truth when they show that? Um, and then, you know, I have people ask me, "Okay, if you require that." Everybody that comes into this particular facility, let's say a gym, uh, is vaccinated, then would you uh, uh, relax the indoor masking um, policy? And that's something I would want to be um, advised on. Uh, you probably all have questions, too, that you'd like to be answered. And I also, this motion would say, hey, there's a bunch of other jurisdictions that are doing this now, right? Um, a city of Los Angeles is proposing one. I think Palm Springs is proposing one. We know New York City has done it. The country of France began telling people they couldn't travel or go to restaurants or theaters unless they could show proof of vaccination. So I want our folks to look at some of the other jurisdictions that have done it. What were some of their challenges? What were some of the pushbacks? What were some mistakes that they made that me we might learn from? Um, I mean, for me, colleagues, my, my goal is that we can keep businesses open uh, and that we don't have to resort back to what we did last year where we limited capacity and we mandated uh, people had to pick up their food from the curb or just outdoor dining. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to get in a place where we shut down businesses because we are just starting to recover from last year's uh, economic impact from this pandemic. So I want to know, does a step like this uh, get us to the goal of keeping our businesses uh, open? Again, we're not mandating anything today. I hope you would support the idea of um, our county experts looking at this and then in two weeks, uh, you know, advising us or giving us our options if, in fact, we want to do this. And when we come back from uh, recess after Labor Day um, or before Labor Day, uh, we, we can decide if that's something we want to do. Maybe the cases are going to drop dramatically in the next few weeks because of what we're already doing. And maybe we won't make this decision. But I want to be informed and I want the public to hear us debate this publicly and talk about it publicly so they know uh, how we think, how we make decisions, uh, and, and the thoughtful questions that we ask and get answered before we um, institute something like this. And the other thing, colleagues, uh, I, I think I know I want to know. Now, if we decide to pass an ordinance that requires proof of vaccination, uh, in indoor public spaces, it would only apply to an incorporated uh, county versus whether or not Dr. Davis decides that a health order um, is, is more appropriate would then would, would apply to the whole county of Los Angeles. So I'm hoping uh, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Davis, you will uh, look at this uh, report uh, and be a part of it and then be willing to tell us uh, what you think is our best path forward. 
Um, Madam Chair, I think you had a friendly amendment that you wanted to propose to this. But again, just to report back, I want to get a few more facts on how this would actually work um, in the County of Los Angeles before we make a decision. Thank you. Madam. Thank, yes, thank you, Supervisor Hahn. And um, I think the operative word here is making sure that we get the word out and we have those discussions as you as you uh, underscore here. And I'm happy to support your motion and thank you for accepting my friendly amendment. And I'd like to read it in if possible. Uh, I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors direct the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs in collaboration with the Chief Executive Officer to report back in writing to the board in 14 days on barriers that small and micro businesses with less than 10 employees and $100,000 in annual revenue could face in implementing a vaccination mandate and recommendations for addressing those barriers, including but not limited to leveraging existing American Rescue Plan Act funded grant programs to support these businesses with an increased cost of compliance. So uh, in the days leading up to June 15th, community transmission rates, as you know, in the county were low. Now we know that uh, they have gone up in the opposite direction. But I do believe that many of our small businesses and restaurants and retail venues and small mom and pop stores did everything they could and they weathered a lot. So I think this amendment will help provide us with some good information as to how we can continue to move forward on your directive and also make sure that we help those vulnerable uh, small businesses and micro uh, enterprises, many of whom represent people of color, women, disabled, and folks that really have been out on, on a limb during the pandemic. So thank you very much for accepting the amendment. Thank you. And, and now we'll recognize Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for the motion that I'll be supporting. Uh, I'm glad it's a report back because I agree with you. We need to collect as much information as possible. I think in addition to the, the types of businesses that um, Madam Chair's motion includes that I hope that in the report back that we could um, solicit input from other organizations that have been impacted by previous closure, houses of worship, you know, other nonprofit organizations that are direct service providers um, that were closed down and we prevented their ability to continue to provide services um, to communities in need. So I hope that through the fact gathering process that those kinds of organizations would be um, 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 solicited, their input and feedback would be solicited as well. You know, I, I've begun to use the term employer because I think sometimes when people hear small business, they think business, but they don't think other of other kinds of employers, like again, faith-based community, community-based organizations. So I hope that they could be included um, in the process um, of providing us feedback in terms of what we could do to alleviate any further strain on those sectors um, as we go forward, particularly in terms of cost burdens to those sectors if, um, it, if we have to go further in terms of closures. So I'll be supporting the motion today and just hope those sectors can be included in the report back as well. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Next, I'll uh, recognize Supervisor Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, too, will be supporting this report back. But I want to offer the suggestion, Fizia, um, Supervisor uh, Solis and I, or Sheriff Solis now, um, created the Economic Resiliency Task Force, which had different industry um, uh, leaders um, to help do a roadmap toward recovery. And I think this would be ideal. Um, I've reached out to restaurants in my district, and I've been getting mixed messages. One of the common questions is enforcement and concerns about how to do the enforcement. But then I've had other restaurants say they want the county to mandate it because, quite frankly, it's a uniformed policy across the board, and um, and it, it it is cleaner to do it that way. And, and some of them are even concerned about the pushback they may get if they mandate um, vaccinations and the restaurant down the street doesn't. Um, so, you know, I, I'm hearing varying degrees of concern, but none of them insurmountable. Um, but I think the, the Economic Resiliency Task Force is already a built-in mechanism where you have industry leaders that are ready to assist. And that might be a good partner to kind of reach out to to, to maybe um, help draw uh, toward the report back. So that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Yes, uh, Fija, what she said. We're on it, supervisors. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, if, there are, if there are no other questions from any member of the board, then hearing no other comments on this item, 73B as amended is before us. Moved by Supervisor Hahn and seconded by myself to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. 73B as amended. Supervisor uh, 73B as amended is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, members. Now we'll move on to item number four, increasing permanent housing by expanding the flexible housing subsidy pool, which I held. And I want to also thank Supervisor Kuehl for also uh, joining me on this matter as well. So colleagues, in order to resolve homelessness in the region, LA County needs to really create a balanced rehousing system. And we know that it's no secret that building an effective homeless rehousing system is our top priority here at the county. While interim housing and shelter access are important, Permanent housing is the most critical component of that system. Without a balanced ratio of interim to permanent housing, people placed in interim housing stay there for much longer than intended and can be costly. According to the Homeless Service Systems Analysis published by Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority back in March of 2020, the region, as we know, still needs around 22,000 units of permanent housing. So we need to increase the county's access to permanent housing to increase turnover in the interim housing and ensure that more people living in the streets can access this important interim resource. There are several permanent supportive housing projects already in the works, which is good, but these projects take time to develop. We need solutions now to quickly expand access to permanent housing across the county. And fortunately, the county has its own regional housing subsidy program that has housed well over 9,000 individuals since 2015. And it's known as the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool, Flex Pool, is a supportive rental subsidy program managed by the Department of Health Services that provides financial assistance and housing retention to support and ensure long-term stability for individuals who have experienced homelessness. The Flex Pool supports clients in, per in apartment units across the County of Los Angeles, as well as permanent supportive housing projects. And every month, the program moves approximately 200 people out of homelessness into permanent housing. Tenants and landlords are provided supportive services to ensure the best outcomes for both parties. The flex pool is an important component for our rehousing system. And with the flex pool, we don't have to wait for a completion of a new permanent supportive housing development. We can quickly connect clients to housing and rental units across the county. With new federal and state dollars coming down the pipeline, we should be prioritizing quick solutions to end homelessness and utilizing the flex pool. That's why I've introduced the motion to look at ways to piece together existing county resources with state and federal funds to create 1,000 new flex pool slots. The motion directs the CEO in consultation with our homeless initiative, HI, and the Los Angeles County Development Authority to report back to us in October, our supplemental budget uh, time with a strategy to create those 1,000 additional flex pool slots. I believe that this investment will help accelerate exit into permanent housing and relieve the pressure on our shelter and interim housing system. So more importantly, I believe it will create a more balanced rehousing system to better serve the county's most vulnerable residents. And I ask for your vote respectfully and would like to now ask for Supervisor Kuhl if she would like to make some comments. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for allowing me to co-author this motion with you. It comes at a perfect time because we are constantly talking about more and varied things that we might do for our uh, homeless population, and it's you know a continuing crisis. Um, this is a nationally recognized model that allowed us to quickly house thousands of really vulnerable people experiencing homelessness by pairing locally funded 
rental subsidies with intensive case management, as well as tenant and landlord services. And we are about to receive a few thousand emergency housing vouchers through uh, the American Rescue Plan, but we still need significantly more resources to support the thousands of individuals living on the streets and in our shelters. Uh, in uh, 2020, loss has system analyst identified we probably need more than 20,000 new permanent housing slots. Uh, we currently fund 5,200 flex pool slots, and this motion asks our county departments to explore expanding by 1,000 more. That's a really important opportunity to leverage federal and state and local resources and really, you know, move to the next level, get another 1,000 people housed, it's a big number, especially one by one and to those people. And, you know, these flex pool vouchers serve populations that can't access federal resources, including undocumented individuals and those who've had any involvement with the justice system, which, as we know, is a significant number of the people who live in our county. Uh, so over the last year and a half, we've repeatedly demonstrated that when the county can marshal and bring together adequate resources and housing, we can rehouse a large number of people pretty quickly. So this is a very important component and I urge an I vote. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Are there any uh, members that wish to be recognized? Seeing none uh, members and this item four is before us. I will move seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item four is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. M members, I'm trying to move quickly here. We'll now move on to item number six, ensuring access to the child tax credit and other financial relief, which I held. Uh, and I'd like to read the following statement in. This last year and a half, as you know, presented unprecedented challenges, but it also has presented some opportunities for us. And in fact, thanks to the leadership of President Biden, the American Rescue Plan included the largest tax child tax credit in history. And these payments can amount up to $4,600 a year per child, depending on the child's age. It also extends eligibility to families who previously earned too little to qualify for the full credit. The program is sure to lift millions of children out of poverty. In fact, one study estimates that it can cut child poverty by 45% nationwide but that requires that families know that the opportunity even applies, uh, is available and they need to apply. This is particularly true for those who do not file tax returns. They need to utilize the IRS non-filer tool, but many do not even know that. There's also been confusion about who qualifies. And yes, that includes immigrant families, unfortunately. And that's why as a county, we have a responsibility in my opinion, to ensure that they do. There are also other programs like the state's golden state stimulus that they can benefit from. A recent report released by the California Policy Lab found that among 950,000 California households that received CalFresh, only 53% claimed the Cal EITC, despite the majority being eligible. This means that they did not get the golden state stimulus, and it also means they very likely did not claim the child tax credit. The remaining 400,000 CalFresh households who did not claim the Cal EITC missed out on an average credit of $172, totaling about $76 million in unclaimed state claims. We also know that there is fear among our immigrant communities that claiming these credits will subject them to the public charge rule. But these payments do not count as income and do not impact a person immigration status or eligibility for any other benefits. So the county, I believe, is well situated to educate our community on the programs. In fact, our Office of Immigrant Affairs is standing up a program to dispel fears about public charge and inform them about services. These uh, 
individuals are involved in this and helping us provide information are known as informadoras. And they can also help inform our community about these tax credits and other financial relief. As we know, our Department of Public Social Services is well situated to do the same. And I'm very pleased to hear that they are already marketing the opportunity in many forums throughout the county. And I know our Department of Consumer and Business Affairs pulled some very helpful information for us analyzing the IRS data to identify the location of children who should be a part of the new child tax credit, but have not been claimed on a recent tax return. These are exactly the vulnerable residents we should do outreach to, and they are predominantly in the first and the second district. And even places like Bell, Cudahy, Westlake, South Central, but also Pacoima, Lancaster, and Panorama City. Outreach in these communities, as you know, is key, and I'm pleased that the motion will ensure just that. Additionally, as we recover from the pandemic, we need to work to advocate for a five-year expansion of the child tax credit and fully uh, know that this has to be uh, a matter that our next legislative package includes. An extended program, as you know, will boost our local economies and advance racial equity. Thank you, colleagues, and I urge your I vote. Are there any members wishing to be recognized on this item? No. Hearing none, item six is before us. I will move, seconded by Supervisor Hahn, to approve the item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item six is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, now, we'll, now we'll move on to item number 14, addressing infrastructure inequity, which was held by Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Mitchell, you have the floor. <coughs> Trying to swallow my sandwich, I'm rushing through. Excuse me, Madam Chair. <laughs> so thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to talk about um, this issue addressing infrastructure inequity. I'd like to thank the Supervisor Hahn for co-opting the motion with me. I also want to give my colleagues a, just a brief bit of background, if I may, on why I felt this motion was important to introduce actually today. The $550 billion national infrastructure bill um, has a clear path for signature, hopefully as early as this month, as it passed off the floor of our U.S. Senate just a few hours ago. This bill has been long delayed and is greatly needed. The last time we saw this kind of investment in our infrastructure was under President Eisenhower's leadership in 1956 when he signed the Federal Aid Highway Act. The Federal Aid Highway Act intended to solve a worthy problem, but in its path, it erased, some would say bifurcated communities of color and decimated home ownership among the African-American community. It created generational pollution in the surrounding majority black and brown communities and has accelerated our climate crisis. As we look to a $550 billion infrastructure investment at the federal level, the question facing our region is how we can ensure we build back better than before. Infrastructure plays a crucial role in ensuring healthy outcomes for our communities, but only if we maintain, if we maintain our focus on eliminating disparities. Infrastructure investments can help prevent traffic deaths that disproportionately kill residents of the second district and black Angelinos every year. Infrastructure investments can catalyze high road job creation and access to opportunity for small businesses. Infrastructure investments can help ensure safe and reliable passage to school, to work, and to open space, which is harder when you do, don't have access to reliable transportation, and demonstratively harder in communities of color than in white communities. And infrastructure investments can help repair environmental harm, improve our air quality, and help reduce CO2, which has a disproportionate impact on the health of communities of color. This is not new information to this board, of course, or to the county. 
Almost exactly one year ago, this board voted unanimously in support of establishing an anti-racist Los Angeles County policy agenda, which called on each department to evaluate existing county policy, policies, practices, operations, and programs through a lens of racial equity to prioritize physical and mental health, housing, employment, public safety, and justice in an equitable way. This kind of analysis is complex and requires specialized training, support, and staff resources to do well. So acknowledging this, my staff work closely with the Department of Public Works on this motion, and I'd like to thank Director uh, Pastrella and his team for their candor and creativity. This motion seeks to ensure that the Department of Public Works has the staff and resources it needs to fulfill our county priorities, particularly given the additional resources that California and our county will likely yield as a result of the passage of this new federal act. Following the report back on resourcing, Supervisor Hahn and I have asked the Department of Public Works to develop several key deliverables to accelerate our county's progress on infrastructure equity, which include best practice research, a set of goals and metrics, a countywide map of infrastructure investments in a single place, and an evaluation of current engagement practices. Colleagues, this is just the first step, and I look forward to working with all of you, the Department of Public Works, the CEO, and others, to dismantle inequitable outcomes and to set a national example of infrastructure justice that, ensure, that ensures that everyone in LA County can and will thrive. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I ask for your support of this motion. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn, you were recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for uh, asking me to co-author this with you. And it is so timely, as you uh, talked about, uh, because of the infrastructure bill that uh, looks like uh, it has bipartisan support uh, to actually get passed and uh, signed by the president. And I heard a speech on the Senate floor uh, yesterday talking about just what you're talking about on, on underserved uh, communities, making sure that uh, we as a country are investing them. And we're taking it locally uh, by saying uh, that we're gonna do the same thing here in the county. And uh, this board, uh, this is just in line with what this board has been doing and taking steps to ensure that we're uh, righting wrongs, we're correcting the course, we're leading with equity in mind. Um, and as we move forward with our anti-racism agenda, we must take a look at inequities from all angles of the county, including how we invest in infrastructure. And this motion, uh, as Supervisor uh, Mitchell said, will direct our Department of Public Works to reassess uh, the way we invest in infrastructure in our underserved, in our underserved, not that they're deserving, they're underserved, uh, and our communities of color. And our hope is that our infrastructure projects are equitable and intentionally planned in a way that will benefit all of our communities, especially those that have historically been overlooked. And this includes where we are going to invest in for instance, road maintenance, um, water infrastructure projects, aquatic centers, public buildings like hospitals and, and libraries, and, and so much more. And we're asking our CEO to help uh, Public Works with the resources they need to carry out what I believe will be the will of this board. Uh, I think it's important that not one area of our county uh, uh, is overlooked or forgotten. And, and really almost as important is that there's not one area of the county that feels uh, like they have been forgotten or overlooked or underserved. Um, we just don't wanna hear that anymore from any of our uh, communities. We want them to know and believe that this county is focusing on making sure um, that uh, we are, um, implementing uh, this directive to, to be more equitable in how we invest in our infrastructure. Um, let's work together on delivering meaningful investments in our underserved communities of color. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, I'll recognize Supervisor Barger. 
Thank you. And I also want to thank um, Supervisor Mitchell and Supervisor Hunt for bringing this motion forward. Obviously, we as a county um, strive to make equity a central focus of policy discussions to help address historic inequities and underinvestment in our communities. Um, we are here to advocate for our districts, our communities, and to bring resources to them. The 5th District is the county's largest, spanning five valleys with 22 unincorporated cities, I'm sorry, incorporated cities, and nearly 70 unincorporated areas. Each city and community is unique in its geography, character, diversity, of racial background, and socioeconomic status, with great differences and needs in each one of those areas as it relates to infrastructure investment. Historically, the 5th District has always received its fair share of investment in public infrastructure, especially with respect to transportation. The 5th District has roughly 55% of the county's center line road miles. However, Public Works allocates certain road fund revenues through a formula that allocates 25% to each district on the basis of center lane, miles of roads, and the remaining 75% is distributed evenly across all five districts. Other local return funds from local sales tax measures approved by LA County voters, such as uh, Prop A, Prop C, Measure R, and Measure M, are distributed on the basis of unincorporated population to support public transit and highway improvements across the county. These choices have led to, to very different outcomes. The pavement condition index and meet, uh, a metrics you, utilized by Public Works to assess roadway con conditions for the North County is significantly lower than that of the South County. Therefore, as we look at infrastructure investment through a lens, equity, uh, lens of equity, we need to ensure that equity is properly defined and that policies we adopt help address inequities that exist today. I really do look forward to this report back. And I would say that, you know, when I look at, especially the North Valley, 58.4% of those living in the Antelope Valley are people of color. 238 live below the poverty level. So I think the assumption that the pockets are located in certain areas of the county, uh, I think you're going to be surprised at actually what, what we are going to fi find in terms of inequities and historical inequities. I fought long and hard for the Antelope Valley. Um, many, many up there feel that they are the forgotten group in LA County. So I look forward to this uh, report back because I think it is going to highlight that a divide by five really doesn't work when we are looking at um, inequities across the board as it relates to the resources. Thank you. And I, I will support this motion because I do think it's a very important motion to bring forward. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Um, I also want to chime in and, and thank Supervisor Mitchell and Han for introducing this very critical motion. We all know that inequities exist all around us. And, We've seen those inequities worsen during the pandemic, but these inequities are most visible when you look at infrastructure. You see it every time you step out onto the sidewalk or whenever you drive down the freeway or any freeway. Racism, discrimination have been shaping our built environment for many decades. Freeways, as you know, have divided and destroyed communities of color throughout the County of Los Angeles. Just look at the 710 freeway, both, both North and South, the five freeway, the 10 freeway, and others. Latinx communities also face limited access to high quality internet services. Our black and brown communities often experience higher levels of pollution, like the cities of Bell and Cudahy, which are located adjacent to the 710 South Corridor. But despite these inequities being so visible, the county does not prioritize infrastructure investments for these communities. For example, public works Road funds for capital projects are not distributed on a need base. 25% of the road funds for capital projects are distributed based on road miles and other 75% is distributed equally to each supervisorial district. But we know that there are unincorporated communities in the county that have experienced historical disinvestment. These communities need more attention and investment. We need to correct the past wrongs. That's why and how equity works. In my district, I see so much need, but we lack the resources to address it. To address it, Dense communities like East LA and Walnut Park often see serious quality of life issues such as illegal dumping 
and trash in the roadway uh, right away and major parking impacts. My district also has so many freeways that cut through densely populated neighborhoods, as I said, and yet we lack adequate sound walls to mitigate the pollution and sound that accompanies those freeways. I hope that the motion pushes public works and our other departments to think about how we can address the issues of equity within infrastructure. So again, thank you, Supervisor Mitchell and Han for introducing the motion, and I do intend on supporting the motion. I look forward to the report back. Thank you. Are there any other members? Any other members wishing to be recognized on this item? Hearing and seeing no other comments then, item 14 is before us, moved by Supervisor Mitchell, seconded by Supervisor Han. To approve the item, Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 14 is before you, Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, members, the moment has arrived. Now we will move on to item 16, transforming measure J. Reimagine Advisory Committee into the Care First and Community Investment Advisory Committee and item 73E, Care First and Community Investment Budget Policy and 73F, Care First Community Investment Funds, which were held by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Kuehl, please unmute your mic and begin your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, nobody's gonna say we didn't tackle the big issues today. Uh, <laughs> It's been fun and it's great to see you all, really. I'm not quite ready to see you all in person, but I love seeing you up on my screen. Um, this, I, I'm really, really proud of what we have done over the past year about criminal justice reform. And as you remember, a little uh, under a year ago, we adopted the Measure J Charter Amendment to the board. Um, at approving it to be placed on the ballot. Uh, because for me, it had been clear for a very long time that our communities wanted change, needed change, wanted us to invest in the community and not in the carceral system. And, you know, we have talked a lot about how long we've been punishing vulnerable populations disproportionately but we already knew that punishment really didn't accomplish much except for perpetuating cycles of incarceration, poverty, and just doing it over and over and over, not creating any opportunities or any differences. Measure J's success at the ballot box showed us that our communities, the people that we represent, really understood this too, across all five districts. And they were insisting that the county budget reflect these priorities and ratified our choice to put it on the ballot. So in essence, what did they agree with? That we should put our money where our mouths are. And we did just that. We established the Measure J Reimagine LA Advisory Committee. We asked community providers and stakeholders to develop all of the spending recommendations for this year and to develop priorities that reflect a commitment to direct community investment and alternatives to incarceration. We also leaned very heavily on the CEO to take on the challenge of analyzing the county's locally generated revenue, identifying the unrestricted parts, calculating a 10% set aside, and turning the advisory committee's spending priorities into the very recommendations that will be presented to us today. So I want to provide sort of an introduction. And then after FISA presents um, the investment funds recommendations and the new budget policy to come back and talk a little bit more about the new advisory committee. But, you know, we asked the advisory committee to complete all of their work in six short months, and it wasn't an easy task. Um, we recognize year one was a great achievement, but we also recognize it was far from perfect and that's okay. We don't expect perfection in the first year as we've been talking about all along and trying to figure out 
what to do about vaccinations. Um, so that's why I'm pleased to bring a motion today and very grateful to have our chair as the co-author to apply lessons learned from year one to a new and hopefully much smoother process for year two. You know, we owe a great debt of gratitude to the Measure J Advisory Committee, to the committee chair, Veronica Lewis, who led with grace and patience, I might say, to the committee members who selflessly dedicated so much time and energy when a global pandemic already had them stretched to the max, and all the community members, community-based organizations, advocates, stakeholders, so many people participating in so many meetings and listening sessions and discussions, we thank you. The committee held its first meeting December 16th, 2021. Nope, couldn't be, because that's this year, 2020, and delivered its final priorities on June 3rd, 2021. And during that six month period, they held 19 meetings as a body, 25 subcommittee meetings, and well over 100 people and 225 individuals attended two listening sessions. So they did a lot. Today's motion builds on the community engagement in the year one process to make it a true focal point for the year two process. About the new uh, proposed committee directs a newly established care first and community investment advisory body to develop an intentional community engagement plan, a big one, a robust one. The Advancement Projects Justice Equity Needs Index will be used as a tool to point the committee in the right direction in terms of identifying communities with the most need, focusing where community engagement needs to take place. We are specifically asking for direct engagement to take place in each supervisorial district. In fact, there should be multiple events in each district. We're asking, also asking the committee to lean on the expertise of our anti-racism, inclusion, and diversity initiative to bring an equity framework to the community engagement and plan. We are increasing the advisory body membership from 17 to 24, adding relevant county departments that are deeply engaged in making sure that this money goes where it's supposed to go. Parks and Rec, Public Social Services, Consumer and Business Affairs, specifically the Office of Immigrant Affairs, Workforce Development and Aging Community, and the Los Angeles County Development Authority. Each of them was chosen because they have the expertise. We'll continue to call on our labor partners, members of impacted communities, youth voices. But in year two, we'll, we'll look to be intentionally inclusive. A motion, the motion proposed to you today adds a representative from the faith community, looks to communities to select members from their own ranks who will bring carefully delineated experience and perspective to the work. And finally, ATI, which will be a non-voting member of the committee, will continue to serve in an administrative role and once again look to leverage the experience of a professional facilitator. So I hope that we can have our CEO present the funding plan to us and the new budget policy, and then maybe just come back and let me wrap up. I know we take separate votes, but, and then, um, you know, members, and then let me wrap up if that's okay. So Supervisor Q, would you like to hear from uh, our CEO right now? I think it would be good to hear because these are the funding recommendations for this yeah. budget and the new budget policy. And then I'll wrap up with what we're doing about the committee uh, a little bit more, and then hopefully everybody will vote for everything. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> but we okay, also, some of us, some of us have also asked to speak. So, yes. but you want us to do it after um, the presentation? Okay. Yeah, after the presentation, okay. and then and then as co-author, I want to make a statement, and then I'll turn turn to you, Janice. Okay, Supervisor Hahn. Okay. All right. So uh, our CEO, Fizia Davenport, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Supervisors. Um, I have prepared a PowerPoint. I'm not sure if it is going to be displayed uh, on the screen, uh, but if not, I will uh, walk you through. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, so thanks again for the opportunity to highlight 
uh, some of the advisory committee's processes and basically the downright hard work that drill and inform the recommendations for the CEO's office regarding the care first and community investment spending plan, also known as the Measure J spending plan. This presentation is designed to provide you with an overview of the processes, the challenges, the lessons learned, and what's on the horizon for the care first and community investment spending plan. Before I start, supervisors, I should provide some context for the name Care First Community Investment because it's new. Many of you may recall that in June of this year, the Superior Court issued a ruling finding that the Measure J ballot process was unconstitutional. The court also ruled, however, that your board could still make the same investments, the same as those contemplated by the Measure J ballot measure, under its own authority. And we know that that court ruling is being appealed. It is this ruling, however, that has caused my office to propose a different name for the budget unit that will be used to administer funds to support alternatives to incarceration and direct community investments. We don't know what will ultimately happen with the litigation around Measure J, but we know that we must move forward. So we developed the name Care First Community Investment as the name for the budget unit to be included in the county's official budget documents to ensure that we had an appropriate reference in county documents, regardless of the outcome of the appeal. However, for purposes of this discussion, I will sometimes use the phrase Measure J because it's very familiar uh, to uh, the folks who have been involved in this work. And sometimes I will use care first and community investments when referring specifically to the budget unit. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So I won't spend a lot of time on this slide. Uh, the purpose of this slide is to essentially point out the three major milestones uh, that was involved uh, with getting us to the point where we are today, which Supervisor Kuehl has, uh, has also addressed one was the establishment of the Alternatives to Incarceration Work Group. We know that they were established in 2019 and they submitted their report to the board in March of 2020. Then we have the establishment of the Alternatives to Incarceration Office uh, that is headed by uh, the Executive Director, Judge Sung Hai Armstead. And then we have the ballot measure, uh, which voters approved in November of 2020. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the Measure J Advisory Committee. So once the ballot measure was passed, the board established an advisory, I'm sorry, once the measure was passed, the board established an advisory committee and the board charged the committee with developing spending proposals for Measure J investments using a transparent and inclusive community process. The advisory committee began meeting publicly in January of this year. And as Supervisor Kuehl pointed out, the attendance at the meetings and subcommittee meetings was consistently robust. Just a note on the timeframes. And the timeframes was an issue that was clearly called out in the advisory committee's report uh, that was received by my office on June 4th of this year. When the committee started meeting, it became clear that there would not be enough time to develop and submit a proposed spending plan in time for the recommended budget phase which occurs in April of each year. But we thought that the committee might be able to make the final changes budget phase, which occurs in June of each year. In order to meet this time frame, the advisory committee and subcommittees met faithfully, sometimes participating in meetings lasting hours. This time constraint impacted the planning process. And as I previously stated, it was called out in the advisory committee's report as a condition that was less than ideal. But at the end of the day, the committee was ultimately able to submit their proposed plan on June 4th after receiving a 30 day extension uh, from my office. Next slide, please. This slide details some of the challenges that were called out uh, in the advisory committee's report. I won't go through all of them, but I will highlight some. The challenges included limited outreach, which in turn limited our ability to have broad community engagement. 
Uh, we know that there were technical glitches uh, that occurred during some of the meetings and that impacted the ability of some community members to fully participate in the engagement process. We know that the subcommittee structure, which is where a lot of the work was done, is very robust, but there was limited departmental input, which limited our ability to essentially leverage expertise in our departments. And then there is the proposal submission process. Uh, the proposal submission process was cumbersome, and for some, it, it was actually not as clear as it could be. I'm going to go to the next slide, please. So although these challenges were clear and there were, there were several, we view each of these challenges as a setup to do better rather than a setback from which there is no recovery. And so this slide identifies the opportunities for improvement. The first is to engage a larger array of stakeholders, including the faith community and other segments of the community who simply felt that they did not have a voice. My office received a number of letters and emails from Black-led organizations, from faith organizations, and from at least uh, one uh, Native American organization, all of whom were aware of the process, but they felt that they had been left out of the process. Next, we have an opportunity to streamline the proposal submission process so that proposals submitted by the community and by the county departments are consistent. And this is really important because it'll make it easier for both the advisory committee and for the CEO staff to elevate, to evaluate spending proposals. In addition, we can avoid the compressed time frame, And the way that we can do that is by taking advantage of the milestones achieved from the year one process, where the funding is allocated in April but the spending plan is submitted later in the year in June. Again, if we implemented this process for year two, that would give the advisory committee almost another year, 12 months, uh, to design, develop, and vet the year two spending plan. It would also continue to allow the CEO's office to make the second installment of the down payment in our recommended budget phase, which of course happens in April of each year. And then finally, we know that we can be more intentional about acquiring information about existing services, whether those services are provided by the county or by community-based providers and use data to help develop and vet proposals. Next slide, please. So on this slide, it just gives you a really high level overview of the proposed spending plan that was submitted by the advisory committee. The advisory committee divided the spending plan into three tiers. Uh, tier one was the highest priority tier and it contained 32 programs. The funding request for the tier one uh, proposals, those 32 programs was uh, $170.9 million. Next slide, please. So what did the CEO recommend? Of the 32 proposals, the CEO is recommending that 29 of the proposals be funded in year one. And the 29 proposals, the funding for those total $187.7 million. I'm gonna explain in a little more detail how we got there, uh, but that 187 million is comprised of 100 million of care first community investment dollars. And then the other 87.7 million is from the American Rescue Plan. There are three proposals that are not recommended for funding at this time because they're either existing efforts underway to address the aim of the proposal and or we need additional information. These three proposals are identified in attachment three of the board letter that is before you with detailed information and a detailed explanation regarding what efforts are underway or what additional information is needed. There are seven proposals that are funded with American Rescue Plan funding totaling approximately $88 million. 
Uh, it's important to note that these are one time dollars in nature and generally must be spent by 2024. As such, funding these Measure J proposals with American Rescue Plan funding, it allows the board to infuse funding into alternatives to incarceration and direct community investments sooner rather than later. The caveat is, however, because they are one time, the advisory committee must watch these seven programs very carefully to determine whether they are programs that they believe should continue to be prioritized with funding with care first community investment dollars. Because once the American Rescue Plan funds expire, there would be no funding to continue to support these seven proposals. If we can go to the next slide, please. This chart basically just shows you a visual context of uh, where we landed on the CEO's recommendations relative to the advisory committee's rec recommendations for the spending plan. Um, under the CEO's recommendations, 91% of the advisory committee's proposals are being funded and they're being funded at a level uh, that is 110% of the requested amount. And as I stated earlier, that 110% is comprised of funds from the American Rescue Plan, as well as, as well as funds that were previously allocated by the board, the $100 million for Care First Community Investment Funds. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned the American Rescue Plan a couple of times, just a few words on that. About uh, just two weeks ago on July 27, your board approved phase one of the county's $975 million American Rescue Plan. Many of the provisions of the American Rescue Plan actually complements the investments proposed by the advisory committee, as well as by the Alternatives to Incarceration Work Group. Community investments are key to building resilient communities and supporting those who have come to rely on the county safety net. As you can see on this slide, the board has approved $390 million for housing and services for homelessness, $314 million for direct community investments, and $47.1 million for programs that will help reduce reliance on law enforcement to provide services that really should be provided by others in the community. Next slide, please. I won't go through these amounts, but these are additional allocations that the board approved under the American Rescue Plan that we believe go directly to community investments. And these amount supervisors, they are over and above the $87.7 million that, are, were, that has been used to fund the seven Measure J proposals that I mentioned earlier. Let's move to slide number 11, please. So what's on the horizon? Um, up on the approval of this spending plan, we will then turn our attention to basically getting these funds out the door. And we want to do that as expeditiously as possible. We will launch a competitive solicitation process for a third party administrator or administrators We'll work with the departments to distribute a majority of their funds to community-based providers. We have developed a streamlined contracting process that we will be piloting in year one. The $187.7 million will be allocated to the appropriate care first budget units during the supplemental budget phase in October. Next slide, please. So as I bring uh, my presentation to a close, I think I have two more slides. Um, I think it's important to point out that we have made every effort to leverage funds where possible and where it made sense to do so. We know the process was not perfect, but we are committed to making it better for everyone. We are developing an equity tool to guide our investments. And finally, we will provide periodic reports to your board and to the advisory committee on where we are with deploying these dollars. 
Next slide, please. And before I, I move on to the, to the summary, um, I've talked about the supplemental budget phase where we will actually move uh, this funding into the various budget units. Um, I've talked about the competitive solicitation process. I wanted to just speak briefly about the methodology and that's item number 73E on the agenda. So we've developed a methodology to allocate the CARE First community investment funds each year. The methodology in a nutshell is a mathematical formula. And what it does is it provides a standard formula for our office to follow each year as we build up to the three year set aside in 2024 and beyond. The methodology will help to provide certainty by deploying a standard process that can be relied upon to determine the full set aside amount in future years, notwithstanding changes in revenue and other factors that will impact the county budget. With that said, supervisors, uh, I will conclude my presentation. Um, I want to thank our ATI executive director, Judge Sung Hai Armstead, who although she has been with the county for less than a year, has really jumped in and rolled up her sleeves to support this process. I also want to thank my entire budget team without whom uh, the methodology policy and the calculation of the set aside would not be possible. And finally, I want to thank your board and your staff for their insight and feedback provided during this process. And with that supervisors, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Fizia, for that great presentation and walking us through it. I think there's a lot to be said about the deck <laughs> and the hard work that goes behind it and everything that you all did. And if I might, I just want to thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, for allowing me to co-author uh, motion, this motion alongside with you. Uh, as you can recall, we put this motion before the board last year to commit and prioritize the importance of ensuring that funds went directly to community to address issues around mass incarceration, homelessness, mental illness, and substance abuse dependencies. Uh, with the continued and sustained support from the residents in LA County, as you know, Measure J received almost 60% of the votes. And today the CEO and the hard work and dedication of the Measure J Advisory Committee put forward a plan totaling almost $188 million for the first year. Originally, remember, it was only going to be $100 million. And this is tremendous, I believe, and I really do want to congratulate the advisory committee